Welcome to episode 130 of the Grip Strip Podcast, the Teammates Tussle Battle of the Heroes edition of the Grip Strip Podcast. My name is Philip Matthew. I'm your host, and I'm here with my co-host, Josh Refine. What's going on, brother? Hey, I'm doing great, Phil. You know, we had a, another great weekend of racing between IndyCar and NASCAR, and yeah, there's definitely a lot of uh, tussling between teammates in both series, and, and especially in Cup, it was definitely a battle of the heroes, like you said, between Kyle Larson and Chase Elliott, but you know, we got a, a lot to get into, of course, and i um, glad to be on back with you this week, and uh, glad to be here to talk about it. Absolutely. We got a lot to go over. Um, the events at Watkins Glen Cup and Xfinity saw young money Kyle Larson get a double and uh, it was the same top two only happened once before in the history of uh, the top two NASCAR series where the top two finishers in both races were the same. So this is only good. So that was a pretty big deal with Kyle Larson and AJ Allmendinger. Uh, both Saturday and Sunday, of course. On Sunday, Kyle Larson used up uh, William Clyde Elliott the second. Uh, if you are a Elliott fan or just somebody you can see uh, or you just have an idea of what racing is, he used up Clyde to win his second race of 2022 and in the process get himself to second in points, uh, which could be big in regards to the amount of bonus points he can get. Since uh, right now, William Clyde Elliott has won the regular season title, uh, will get 15 more playoff points to add to his current 25-point total. So you will more than likely start with 40 points going into the playoffs. We'll talk about all the that happened between Larson and Elliott. We'll also talk about Kimi Raikkonen, the 2007 Formula One World Champion, making his uh, Cup Series debut for Trackhouse's Project 91. Had a good run going, uh, went away after stage two, seven international drivers, which was the most ever in a, in a cup race. So that's pretty big to, in, in history of cup, I would say. Uh, one spot's left for 15 drivers, including those that are currently third and sixth in the overall points. So we will have a little bit of a discussion there, Josh and I, in regards to is this really the best format? Is Are we really putting the best foot forward or the best? drivers out there within this format no um yeah yeah <laughs> and i don't i i don't believe we are either uh larson of course uh won on saturday but that was in part because uh keebler gibbs and william byron the two best cars in the racetrack on saturday got into each other in the inner loop and um Junior, uh, I think I, I'll probably do my impersonation at least of him doing his call there. I, I could probably do that. I need to go back and watch that. I That's what I should do from now on. I think after starting next week with Daytona, because Junior gets so fired up about Daytona, I'm going to try to reenact some of his calls here on the Grip Strip podcast for those that love Junior. Uh, like uh, I have become a junior fan since he's become retired Dale Jr. Uh, Justin Allgaier had a weird incident early in the race and lost a lot of points. Uh, Allmendinger second place finish essentially has given him a full race lead in the regular season standings. So that could in turn with the rest of this regular season, they still have a few more races to go, could possibly lead to him getting some key points. Those 15 playoff points, I think, amongst who he's around would be the most valuable to A.J. Allmendinger in that Xfinity battle. We mentioned the Penske guys at Worldwide Technology Raceway Gateway. Joseph Newgarden wins for the fifth time in 2022, the most wins he's had in one season in his career, and he's had a great career, of course, two-time IndyCar Series champion, trying to go for the third championship. Uh, narrows the gap to his teammate Will Power, who set, who tied Mario Andretti for the most polls in the history of IndyCar. The points battle, we'll talk about that. Scotty McLaughlin and, and Newgarden after the rain had a great battle there. And the person that got in between them at the end of the race was rookie David Malukas, the guy who um, Josh mentioned it on the socials, said I, I, I did pick him as a wild card. I did pick him as my rookie of the year. Uh, choice at the start of the year. I, I think you picked Lundgaard. I believe you picked Lundgaard. I'm just remembering off the top of my head. Yeah, I might be wrong. Go back on that, but yeah. Um, and, and, both and I picked pretty Malukas. good picks. 
Yeah, so I think we both were hedging our bets, and I think, or I might have picked Kirkwood. One, of, yeah, it's one. Of, uh, it, either way, I, I think I said I, somewhere. I know I said Malukas. I feel like I said it on here. Why would I say yeah. anywhere else? I mean, uh, you but, were pretty high on uh, Kirkwood at the beginning of the season. I remember that. Yeah, I was, and I forgot that he was driving for AJ Foyt. Um, that's <laughs> part of the problem. Um, We'll get into the Indy cars, of course, and everything now that they only have two races to go in their season. The roundup will go over the NHRA at Brainerd. It was just Nitro this past weekend leading into the U.S. Nationals here uh, for Labor Day weekend here in a couple of weeks. MotoGP and Moto2 at Austria returning from their summer break. Pekko Bagnaia gets his third consecutive victory uh, on the Ducati, but the amount of mistakes he made early in the year probably has rendered all those wins irrelevant to um, Fabio Quattararo. Supercars at Sandown, typical. Uh, Shane Van Gisbergen gets two out of three wins. Uh, the uh, DJR team, who has gotten new investment partners uh, recently, uh, wins with Will Davison in one race. So we'll get into that in a little bit. F2 and F3 will tell you the point standing is going into Spa. They'll be racing here in the next few weeks uh, during the European swing. GTs, uh, GT uh, Pro and GT Am, or whatever, GTD, GT Daytona, or whatever the hell they call it. Uh, they'll uh, uh, be racing at VIR this weekend, Michelin GT Challenge, which will be their next to last race before Petit Le Mans here in about four or five, like about five weeks' time. Uh, we'll preview Spa. For Formula One and their return after summer break, of course, we will do Cup and Xfinity at Daytona preview picks. Josh will bring the algorithm back out of hibernation. It is a super speedway special. It has been known to pick winners. It did pick Tate Fogelman. So it should, be, wild. <laughs> it should be the Tate. We should just name it the Tate Fogelman <laughs> algorithm uh presented by josh because that's you that was literally the one of the first picks if not the first pick you ever made on with it and it worked so in honor of a guy that we've never interviewed may never interview we're just going to name it the tate fogelman algorithm so we'll we'll bring that out later on a lot of talk about uh football since we're getting so close a week left in the preseason uh week two just passed and then fall brawl drafted so my league Josh has been in it, finished second and third, or third and second, the last in his two years so far in this league, trying to get to the first position. We had our draft last night, had some spirited discussion, uh, mostly led by me. Uh, but, you know, it is what it is. Everybody participated in the draft, which was nice. I think that's probably the first time ever in all the years that I've run my league that I've had full participation in a draft. So, and having at times at least six out of 10 people in uh, to be in the Zoom call was pretty good. So one of these days, maybe we'll do a live live draft. Uh, that that's that seems likely. I think we might have the right group of people to make that happen. Uh, Josh will uh, talk about iRacing, sim game, Formula One, et cetera, et cetera. That uh, goes on uh, with uh, in within the sim segment, and then we'll close the deal. But I'd be remiss. Uh, before we move forward and start talking about Cup and Xfinity at Watkins Glen, we have we've had uh, support from uh, Map Three Hundred and Sixty Collective getting some tickets. We've talked about it here in recent weeks. Pocono, Watkins Glen. Josh is actually going to be able to go to Daytona here this weekend for the uh, Coke Zero Four Hundred, and uh, we have a little thing we have to talk about in regards to that for for them, for NBC. So anything can happen in Daytona experience, the thrills, the drama, and the acceleration on, on all, on all on NBC. They, somebody needs to really copy edit this stuff for them. The last chance to qualify for the playoffs continues on Saturday, August 27th on NBC and Peacock TV and NASCAR and NBC or NBC sports. Uh, you can, you can, Use all those Twitter handles, so NBC, Peacock TV, NASCAR on NBC, NBC Sports with the hashtag NASCAR. They'll be on, I think, regular NBC this weekend for the uh, Coke Zero 400 and uh, one last race before the playoffs, 7 p.m. Eastern this Saturday night for the Cup Series playoff 
uh, or the regular season finale, what used to be the Firecracker 400. So we will uh, probably reference that there a couple more times. So if you're offended by ads, well, sorry, we have to do it here. That's part of why we've gotten some free tickets. Um, and Josh is actually going to be able to utilize them. So it's nice. Uh, but I think something that's really spicy to look at uh, coming into Saturday between two guys that have the personality of a of a spoiled lemon uh, in William Clyde Elliott, the second, the now regular season champion, trying to win his second cup championship, the 2020 series champion, and his teammate, the 2021 series champion who won 10 races and dominated in Kyle Larson. They were the dominant figures yesterday at Watkins Glen and the go bowling at the Glen. Uh, and they, they, it really was uh, straightforward for them. They were going to, uh, they led a lot of the race there. I mean, Chase, yeah, Chase led the most laps, of course. And uh, there were a bunch of guys that led laps during the day. Logano, McDowell, look, McDowell had a fast car. I mean, I don't like the guy. I never have liked the guy, but McDowell had a car to win that race yesterday. But I guess Strat didn't really work out so well for him, pit stops and all that. But the five and the nine were up there all day. And at the end of the day, at the end, when it counted last restart, Kyle Larson basically acted like Chase Elliott wasn't there and decided not to make the turn one. And uh, uh, it allowed him to go and win the race uh, over AJ Allmendinger. Joey Logano, as I mentioned, he won stage two, finished third. Uh, Clyde finished fourth, got stage points in stage two. Uh, Led the most laps, as I mentioned. Daniel Suarez gets another top five on a road course for Trackhouse. McDowell, as I mentioned, finished sixth. Tyler Reddick, seventh, trying to go for three consecutive road course wins. Falls a little short in that. Christopher Bell coming from tailback, as the guy who gave the command to start engines would say. Finished eighth. Christopher Busher finished ninth. And Eric Jones, that Jones boy from Byron, Michigan, finished tenth. Uh, so that's, I guess, the first piece is Larson and Elliot, Josh. Uh, I've been talking for a little while here, so I'll let you go and um, give your two cents on that. Because uh, to me, I the I the way that Elliot handled that that post race interview, it, you knew in all his heart he wanted to basically mf the guy if he knows how to, or say make some you know you know sign that his kind would do. But the fact of the matter is he basically bit his tongue because he's a Hendrick motorsports driver. Uh, but I, that he feels aggrieved from this race. He feels aggrieved from ACS earlier in the year when Larson, of course, won that race too. Uh, and it's probably one of the things that NASCAR needs if they really want to have a compelling championship battle is these two guys battling each other. Uh, probably would be a good thing, honestly, because if they run each other over, then it gives somebody else an option, an opportunity to go and win this thing. Yeah, of course. I mean, this uh, it brings a different chapter, different element into this uh, playoff title fight here coming up after Daytona. And yeah, I think for Chase Elliott, I mean, go back to uh, Atlanta, or not Atlanta, but uh, Auto Club, and he was pretty pissed off on the radio. He even called him, you know, the stupid motherfucker, God damn it, uh, in reference to uh, Kyle Larson back uh, in February when uh, Chase was on the outside of him going into turn one and Larson went up to uh, block him and, uh, you know, put him in the wall there and then Chase spun out later and that ruined his race. And then you go to this one uh, that just happened at Watkins Glen and uh, Kyle Larson went for it in the corner and in turn one and and locked up the the right front uh and slid up into chase elliott and uh slid chase elliott back uh into fourth place and you know larson goes on to win picks up you know second win of the year and sweeps the weekend and you know meanwhile chase elliott gets a meaningless uh participation trophy uh aka the regular season title so you know there's um a lot of things that you know you have to consider, like going forward, how do they race each other um, in the playoffs? Uh, you know, of course, Chase Elliott was so angry, I guess, that he kept saying, "We're going to Bristol," um, and it's probably a missed opportunity if Napa doesn't send him to Bristol real quick during this week. I mean, he's got time; he's got I'm the regular the season. Trick. Yep, exactly. The 2001 commercial from Michael Waltrip and Napa—they got to recreate it now with Chase Elliott. Uh, 
and they got time. You know, he's got time now this week. You know, doesn't really need to prepare much for Daytona. Um, you know, he's locked up the the regular season title, so he can go film that commercial real quick and put it on the screen during the race. Uh, and that's that's how you capitalize on this right there. Uh, but going forward in the playoffs, you know, I mean, hey, let's go to Bristol. Let's skip let's skip three weeks to Bristol. I mean, um, let's say one of these guys is on the line for elimination, you know, does Chase Elliott pay back the favor and, you know, bump him out of the way to, you know, potentially get back into playoff contention or, you know, say, let's say Kyle Larson is on, you know, on the edge of, um, you know, being eliminated if that, uh, should that happen and they get into it again or even later on in phoenix like you said like they get into each other there and that creates an opportunity for somebody else say like a ross chastain or um uh you know uh uh kyle bush or somebody Logano like that yeah, or, Logano. or hamlin if he back yeah, Denny hamlin. His way exactly there. exactly so there's a lot of possibilities here with that um and you know we'll have, we'll have to see how it plays out but I'm um, sure. I'm sure. Uh, Rick Hendrick probably not not wanting this, and you know, of course, they had a talk after the race, and you know, he, Chase Elliott put his uh, you know company hat on and just said congratulations over and over again, and of course, um, you know, he could see it on his face how pissed off he was and everything, and uh, you know, I uh, you know, it's basically the uh, nice version of Kyle Busch when you know Kyle Busch uh, gave his uh, I'm just here so I won't get fined reminiscent of. Uh, Marshawn Lynch is basically the same thing, uh, but, you know, filtered for Hendrick Motorsports. So, yeah, th- this is going to be interesting, but, you know, um, Kyle Larson um, gets the win finally. Uh, kind of a drought this year. Uh, probably what should have won a lot of races this year. Um, Coke 600 comes to mind uh, there, but um, that now has a little bit of momentum with the weekend sweep going into uh, Daytona and then start off the playoffs uh and at Darlington, so we'll see how everything plays out. I actually picked Kyle Larson to win the Xfinity race. I, I did pretty good this week. It doesn't happen very often. Um, it's not a 410 sprint car race, or else I really would pick him all the time. But <laughs> I was picking him, I think by the end of last year, I think I picked him every week. I don't even remember anymore, but I figured I just got oh, sick just and tired of it. In, like, yeah, just throwing in Kyle Larson. Yeah, it, it may have not been. I think, yeah, I would pick him for every race by the end of last year. I just got so fed up with it um, and because of his the media portrayal of how he's a victim, since he's such a victim for being a moron from freaking Bumblefuck, California, who, yeah, he's a victim, all right, fucking cocksucker. Um, he's such a victim, he's second in points, and after this victory – all of a sudden, I mean, the, he, I don't know where that came from, honestly, because it's not exactly like Larson's been set in the world ablaze with his productivity this year in the Cup Series relative. Obviously, it's very difficult to to go in and defend a title. I, I'm not taking anything away from the guy in that sense, but you win 10 races, you destroy in all levels in all areas and i mean i'm just i'm just gonna go back here 10 races 20 top fives 26 top tens and 36 events and he had an average finish of 9.1 so that is really and 31 out of 36 races on the lead lap uh you know that is insane so it's asking a lot i mean denny hamlin's statistics were close as really close in top fives top tens but and his average finish was actually better than him, but the victories are what really uh, played the played the part. Um, I mean, but this year, uh, Larson he has he has as many he's tied now with uh, Clyde and Ross Chastain with the most top fives in in the Cup Series. I guess I I don't know. I, his average start, of course, is the best of anybody's, uh, which probably helps. He has a thirteen four average finish. Which is only third. So there you go. So somewhere, somewhere along the line, I guess I'm not. Uh, it's probably me because I just don't care for the guy. But the MFR has been running good, and it just hasn't looked as prolific because he isn't winning every freaking week like he usually does. Uh, but in this case, he's second in points. The now the playoff point situation. He's going to gain. I think if he stays where he is, which he has a twenty. 
or right now he has, yeah, he has a nine point lead on Ryan Blaney, which we're going to get into Ryan Blaney here in a moment. But uh, Logano, he's got 21 points on who's the next locked in driver at the moment. If he can keep that gap, then there's a high likelihood he's going to gain, uh, what is it, 10 bonus points, I believe is how it works, because you gain the top 10, get bonus points. Joe, our uh, regular uh, guest and friend Joe Passero, posts uh, on his Twitter handle, at Passero Jr., I post or I retweeted it um, in regards to uh, his uh, playoff uh, ranking or playoff uh, setup right with the points and it shows that as it stands the regular season points yeah kyle larson would get 10 blaney would get eight if he were to get in as of current lock current standings logano seven and so on until 10th with will byron but uh yeah i mean larson is a factor because if he gets hot here i mean he's lost he's lost his crew chief this year and other guys have lost their crew chief this year but if he gets hot now, it could happen. And and Elliot, you know, who's dominated this season, his points, he's got so many more points than uh, he's he's a hundred and thirty four point lead. So over the course of twenty, what is it? You're talking of uh you know, I'm gonna do this. He's averaging at least just over Kyle Larson, he's running five positions better than him across the entire season for every race. And it's going to get reduced down to like whatever 17, uh, which is what the whole point of playoffs is. But I'm sure that doesn't make him any happier either. I think he was a lot. He felt a lot better about circumstances when it was the likes of Ross Chastain, who supposedly has been involved in an incident for now seven weeks in a row. Uh, He was part of uh, what ended up uh, sending his teammate Kimi Raikkonen, not on, I mean, whatever, intentionally, unintentionally sending his teammate uh, Kimi Raikkonen out of the race. He was part of uh, or an incident with Chase Briscoe, uh, probably something else because it's Ross. Uh, was he with and, Chase Briscoe, though? Because I think I they both ran recently. off. They both ran. They both were running close and they both. They I don't even know if they made contact. It. They overcooked it in the inner loop and they both spun out. So the fact is he's it he's proxy. So as yeah. long as you're anywhere near as long as he's anywhere near somebody with a vehicle, we're just going to blame Ross Chastain in this case. Not just not whether he does anything or not. It, 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 just say just say it's Ross Chastain's fault. It doesn't. Oh, matter. Yeah. <laughs> if the watermelons start going bad in the country, it's Ross Chastain's fault too. It doesn't matter. Just just blame Ross Chastain. That's what everybody in the NASCAR media does. Yeah, exactly. Um, chastained yeah everyone's getting chastained that's the thing now when you see you know when you have become a word like you're in you're a verb you're you when you've become a verb that's that's that is next level you know like ernie irvin they didn't he didn't become a verb he just had a nerve he they named him swerve and irvin you know he's just chastained is even bigger than swerve and irvin which is essentially (laughs) what he is um you know and 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 what do you call uh justin marks is just leaning into it he don't care he this is full wwe and it is wwe with race cars so that's yeah. what like ross chastain is like the rick flair i i know wrestling people if there are wrestling people listening to the show may get offended by that but he's trying to do his best rick flair and honestly i want him to chair shot those hendrick motorsports guys and then he'll probably let a ford win so it'll make me happy but um yeah, I mean, we went over those two guys, but I think uh, the other piece, I mentioned it with uh, the international drivers. Of course, Kimi Raikkonen finished 37th in the end. Um, Tilly drives the 78 car and has issues every time he seems to run it. Uh, Danny Kvyat made another run for the Hedzeberg car team. Uh, Loris Hesemans ran. I picked him to finish last. Obviously, Kyle Tilly felt uh, like he would finish last for him instead. Uh, we had Mike Rockenfeller, the former Le Mans winner. Those, so all the European drivers, none of them finished better, or international drivers finished better than 30th, but it was big news, and of course, Kimi was the biggest news story and got tons of attention. Uh, I think it was a, a bad sell in regards to talking to Rocky, who's done so much in sports cars, and uh, 
caveat who is a formula one driver and has finished on a podium in formula one you know like come on you know like like you at least talk to those guys maybe even though they have no real shot they're not in good equipment i get it but um the way the weekend was going Raikkonen just kept on getting faster and faster but then that's Kimi that's just what he is when he's motivated it's amazing how good of a driver he was and is and um curious he said something at the end that he might have hurt his wrist um during that incident whether it was because the spits the wheel went around on him or the way the whoever hit him Hensemans hit him they're coming out of uh the inner loop might have hurt his wrist so who knows when he'll be back i don't it sounds like well they're not going to have the car the rest of this year um my my inclination is it'll be at the daytona 500 and it'll have elio castro neves in it no matter what um justin mark says um but i mean kimi the i guess that's the thought josh we we talk about what he did this um past weekend and and i guess in general what it means that this next gen car has made it so that maybe we could have more international drivers show up and and run in the sport, a sport that has been a part of our lives for so long. But to have people coming from across the pond and other countries being interested and have a chance, theoretically, to compete is something that I don't think we would have really thought about or thought would be possible. It hasn't really happened since the days of the great Dick Johnson driving in in the late 80s, really, early 90s kind of deal. Yeah, of course. I mean, I think, you know, with Kimi Raikkonen coming over here gives credibility to um, this series when it comes to um, being able to to handle a next-gen car. Um, Because, you know, I think if he had come here and ran last year's car, it probably would have struggled a lot. And um, maybe not as much, but definitely would not have, uh, I think, wowed as much people. Um, and you would definitely have seen a lot, uh, you know, a lot more struggle there. But you know, with the next gen car is, uh, you know, it's designed more with the road course background in mind, of course. Uh, you know, I think it's kind of based off of, you know, the design of the Trans Am car. Um, and you're, you know, you have the more GT car style design so um i think the adaptability when it comes to people who are from international like kimi raikkonen like mike rockenfeller or any other driver that's um never raced in a um, stock car series before or has um you know little to no experience in, in a heavy car like that but has you know racing experience whether it's in a open wheel car or a, a gt car um, you know, can come up, come over to NASCAR and potentially um, run uh, in a race. You know, given prior the proper preparation, like Kimi Raikkonen did. You know, with the simulator, uh, doing pit stop practice with the team, uh, doing you know private testing uh, as they're allowed because they said Raikkonen was allowed to do a a, a private test with a, a different team just to get him uh, a seat time and get used to the uh, the car uh, and everything. They said that on the broadcast, but. Um, I think you know when you when you consider all that, um, it makes it easier for drivers like that, and I think it opens the door potentially maybe for um, you know if a driver in a different series, um, you know, say like in Formula One, we have a lot of drivers that are um, potentially you know they they have a, a chance to get in there, but um, you know oftentimes they either fizzle out or um, the opportunity never comes, and um, you know they either go to IndyCar and uh, run there. Or, you know, potentially now they could, you know, eventually go to NASCAR instead and run run here in the States. And you know, given that, you know, the Cup Series is also beginning to be more road course centric with um, the amount of road courses that we had on the schedule this year and uh, m- most likely for next year, um, there's a chance that, um, you know, for a road course guy, they can come here and be competitive uh, relatively quickly. So um, I think, you know, that that's uh, kind of the impact that um, this this car brings and, you know, what Kimi Raikkonen, you know, is able to do. And I think for Raikkonen and his team, you know, with uh, Justin Marks, I mean, they, they had the idea and, you know, they kind of spearheaded this idea of uh, trying to get guys to come over here to bring bring appeal to NASCAR from worldwide and, and all of that. So um, that's, you know, it's a great idea. It's been, you know, so far it looks like it's been executed pretty well. So, um, you know, we'll love to see what comes out of it next and 
you know, like we said, probably probably going to be uh, Elio Castroneves more than likely um, from what people are saying, probably going to be the next guy uh, at Daytona or something like that. So, um, you know, would be interested to see that. So, um, you know, of course, it's uh, it's going to be interesting to watch um, in the future as more international drivers get into NASCAR. But I will say for Raikkonen, um, you know, throughout the weekend, you were, I was, you know, really interested i guess in you know how his pace was going to be and um overall in qualifying i mean he qualified 27th but um I, you know they were able to use strategy to get up into the top 10 uh and race uh, up there and you know he's racing against chase elliott who's you know the champion from two years ago and of course um was the dominant driver of the day so uh says a lot about you know this car and a lot about uh, says a lot about his driving talent that you know he's able to adapt really quickly and you know, potentially have a, a top 10 finish right there within, within reach, uh, and something that wasn't, you know, totally unreasonable. So, um, it's, I think it's still a solid debut, even though it ended in a crash and, you know, hopefully he decides in the future, you know, decides to maybe come back and try this again next year, potentially, maybe, maybe they can work out a deal to go to Coda. Cause of course he's won there at Coda in the past, at the, uh, 2018 U S uh, Grand Prix. So, um, that seems like a natural, maybe natural fit for Kimi Raikkonen to go out and uh, try in this car again. And, you know, maybe we see that happen next year. Yeah. And I think I was just thinking about when you were talking about with the road courses and the road course centric nature of cup, the Chicago streets at July the 4th weekend. If you are a GT driver that isn't contracted by a factory, or if you are like Jordan Taylor I know that Jordan Taylor wants to drive a NASCAR vehicle of some sort. Uh, let's just say I think he's going to have a chance to have an opportunity next year at that particular race. If they're not racing somewhere else, uh, that's the issue with him. So, of course, and there's the calendar. But um, the notion of those kind of guys, you know, Rocky is a good example of that. I think if you're a GT-centric driver, GT3 You've ran Le Mans, you've ran like the whatever GTLM class, now the GT3 centric cars, or you're a TA2, like Connor Mozak, who drove uh, in the Xfinity race and was having a good run. Young Gun, guy who I think has a future, might be making a future trying to get here, the NASCAR. Uh, there are going to be some, a lot of guys getting calls. Uh, it it kind of harkens back to the days of the Boris Seds and Ron Fellows, you know, where they would be called in because they could do the job a little better than who was driving the car regularly, or they'd make a car so that they could uh, team to go and have them out there. And they were able to do work uh, more times than not, or at least give themselves an opportunity to, and then, you know, whatever happens, happens. Um, I think that's a nice thing to see. Uh, I don't I mean, we'll see what happens with the, uh, uh, Code, um, what do you call it? Uh, Brovel. I don't know how many uh, specialists will be out there. Uh, I th- I would venture to say Enzimans or Kvyat may show up, and then the 77 might have a specialist, and then Joey Hand will run, of course, again. Uh, but it won't be as subscribed because, of course, it's a playoff and it's a cutoff race in the playoffs. So that's something we'll see. Now, Last thing we'll talk about before we move on to Indy cars is the current playoff situation uh, as it stands going into Daytona. So now Kurt Busch is also locked in to the playoff. Now, it may not mean anything uh, if he doesn't race at Darlington in a couple of weeks time, but we're hoping he does. Uh, he won't be at Daytona this weekend. Uh, right now, 15 drivers are locked into the playoff. Chase Elliott, of course, has locked up the regular season title. There is still some battles in regards to the people trying to get into the top 10. The top 10 in overall points would get bonus points. Now, of course, two of those people and Ryan Blaney and Martin Truex Jr. are in a battle to actually make the playoff. One of those guys is not going to make it. Ryan Blaney is third in points has been in the top five in points virtually the entire year. Truex has basically been in the top 10 in points the entire year. Uh, The notion that two guys that have over 26 weeks actually performed on a generally more often than not, not week by week basis since this format doesn't really ask you to do so. Um, It may be the old school in me, 
Uh, maybe the fact that I came in when you actually had to run well and when DNFs mattered and all that, you know, because you lost so many points. And now this format is, oh, you win a race and you could shit the bed the rest of the year. And it doesn't matter. I mean, McDowell did that last year, uh, ran over both Penske cars, wins one race, finished like 25th in points, made the playoff and he was out of there in three races. Like, I mean, you're telling me he's more deserving than somebody who was in the top 10 in points. It didn't get that far because obviously there weren't that many drivers at one. It wasn't that big of a, it wasn't as extreme as what we have right now, but we're running into a, th- a situation, Josh, where I mean, I say this as a Chase Briscoe fan, and I'm putting this out there. It's the same as 2011 when Tony Stewart said we're wasting a playoff spot. I don't care how many effing stages Chase Briscoe wins. They always win stage one of a road course and disappear the rest of the race. They've done that for three consecutive road course races. In none of those races have they actually had a finish of any value. He's a waste of a playoff spot. And Austin Sidrick, God love him. He's going to win rookie of the year because there's virtually no chance, virtually no chance. This could all change on Saturday. One of the two rookies could win, but they're not going to up, you know, they're, that isn't going to overtake the Daytona 500, but he, he's going to win rookie of the year, but he hasn't done enough to be in this playoff. And I, and personally, you can go as far, I, I would go as far as Bowman, Suarez, Sindrick, Briscoe, Kurt Busch. Kurt Busch is because of injury. I don't know if he would really be up there one way or the other. I don't think any of those guys really should be in the playoff. It doesn't add anything to the playoff. Why? Because none of them are going to be there after the round of 12 is done. So to me, why are they in there in the first place? Isn't the playoff supposed to be? I get in all these sports are expanding playoffs and, you know, you have more teams and it's becoming more like participation trophies. And that's what NASCAR is all about, I guess. But and it, the playoff should actually be it should feel like you're in there and you really have had to battle. Uh I don't know how, like I was trying to figure out how to word it earlier. And if you win multiple races, even if you've had a shit, you've had a shitty year in a lot of ways, which of course Danny Hamlin has, but he's still 14th in points. He's ahead of a, ahead of Sindrick and he's ahead of Briscoe after basically not existing for like think a month this season. You know, uh, Tyler Reddick is in that same mix as well. They're all in that same realm. Kyle Busch is just lucky Chase Briscoe ran over Tyler Reddick at Bristol or else he'd be in play. You know, the my idea is what they used to have, like the 12 drive, like the the it was the 20. I think the first change they made to the playoff. I don't remember what year it was. I think it was 10 or, or 11. What I wanted like, to the 12. They expanded to 12. 12. OK, so yeah, seven. And 2000. that was in response to. Dale Jr. and Jeff Gordon both missing the playoffs yeah. in uh, 2005, and then Tony missing it Tony in Tony missing in 2006 and finishing 11th. That's exactly right. My, so good call on that, man. Um, thank you for that. That is what we – so it was the top 10 in points, and then the next two drivers who had the most points or wins or whatever, however it came up. If you were outside of the top 10 in points and you had won like three races – we'd let you get into the, that you get into the playoff. You're on the back end. You don't have as many points, but you're in. That was response to two of the biggest drivers in the sport in 05. And then the defending series champion in 06. And then Tony won, I think three races in 2006 playoffs or something like that. And in response to that. So that I think was the best setup. You could still have your resets and your playoff points and whatever, 12 drivers. You have 36 cars locked in every single week based on these charters. A third of them making the playoff versus 16. It's only four cars, right? Oh, it's only four cars, but it means more. You put value on actually showing up and being either in the top 10 in points or winning enough races, which the vast majority of the top 10 have done. And then you would have the two drivers outside of the top 10 who would make the playoffs. So it, just based on, I'll, I'll just use Joe's um, rundown from earlier today. And I'm looking at it right now. The only people, so if you did the top 10, Byron has uh, two wins. I'm I like I, what I'm saying is if you have multiple wins, you'd be in. So that means one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. 
So eight drivers would be in based on that. Then I would then go and say that Ryan Blaney and Martin Truex would be in. They'd either get in because of the points or they'd either get in because of being those extra two spots. That means all the one race winners would have an issue. There would only be two of those one race winners making it in based on my unscientific format, which leaves, you know, Chris Bell and Kyle Busch would be the two guys. Then all those guys that I mentioned that don't really belong would all be in a, in would be in an issue. And essentially the playoff, it wouldn't even be about any of those other people. The, the, all these other guys that they're talking about, all these the, the 15 drivers we'd have, it would be even more condensed and it would be even more pressure inside a smaller group because it's less people. There should be more pressure to make the playoff than, I mean, Corey LaJoy is the only guy that's knocked out of here, right? Yeah, Corey LaJoy and Cody Ware who doesn't even run every week. Joey Hand, like if Joey Hand would probably beat Cody Ware if he was running every single week. That's how he's there. He's scored more points than David Reagan. But Dave Reagan's only run, what, two times, three times this year? So, I mean, it's insane. Like, Corey LaJoy is 31st in points. God love him. He does a great podcast. He's great in media. He is a great mechanic, and I think he would be an amazing crew chief. That team is garbage, and he's not that good of a race car driver. God bless him. He wouldn't be in the playoffs. Based even on this format, he wouldn't even be in the playoffs because he'd be out because of points. How would they justify a guy that has won a race that that's another thing. All right. So I'll let you go here, Josh, but if he had won at Atlanta, let's just say he goes and wins at Atlanta instead of Clyde and he's outside of the top 30 in points. He can't make the playoffs because he's outside of the top 30 in points. What are they going to do? They're going to give him a waiver. They've given waivers before, but it, how could you justify that? The guy has not done enough. He's 31st in points. There's 32 people literally that have run every race this year. He's 31st out of 32. God love Corey LaJoy. I respect him. I've seen him win live. That speaks to people. I'd be like, holy shit, you saw Corey LaJoy win a race. The guy can drive a race car when he has something. I don't know if it's just him or whatever. I don't know. When he had the Rulo Brothers stuff in Arca, when Arca was somewhat of a legitimate series, he was still good. But my God, to get eliminated to the point where he's good at Daytona, but he has no chance. Like, that is sad. You've ran all year. You are not even in. And there's two guys, like, like fucking McDowell got a 100-point penalty or something. He got a death penalty, and so did Brad. Not Both of them are ahead of him in points. I mean, like, what the fuck? I mean, you have Ty Dillon. I mean, he sucks. Todd Gilland has a chance. He's on the bump at 30. Michael McDowell, yeah, he's 24th. I mean, I don't know. I don't know the logistics because they'd have it's a to me the way I'm bringing it up in my mind, Josh, it sounds like a cluster for NASCAR. So it kind of makes sense because how are you going to justify having guys that haven't won a race, but people who are outside of the top 10 in points get in because they have multiple race wins. It emphasizes winning more in the regular season, but it also my thing is it puts winning in perspective in the regular season, but it also puts being competitive in the regular season in play. So it would guarantee based on points, Ryan Blaney, Martin Truex Jr. So there would be more people that would be battling for two spots or whatever, because it would be for two spots, not one number one. And it would be amongst anybody that has won a race this year, which I think in turn If somebody, well, no, it would have to be somebody who already has won a race. So it would mean like in my format, it would essentially take uh, Bowman, Suarez, Sindrick, and Briscoe. Eric Jones is actually in it and Eric Almirola. So, okay, those two guys actually, if they won a race and they scored enough points, could actually get into the top 16 that way. So they would actually have the points to get there. So I don't know. What were your thoughts on? I've been pontificating. I've been whatever, but that was my rough idea. And I think it sounds in my mind, it sounds better than what the hell they have right now. Yeah, but it, it makes for good TV. That's the problem. And, you know, they, they can sell cause they're going to go into this weekend. Um, and you have how many, however many drivers that are eligible for the one last spot all the way through 30th place. You know, you got Brad, who's basically been MIA since Daytona. Um, 
Ricky Stenhouse who shows up every now and then. Ooh, Richard. Yep, that's right. And then Michael McDowell, who actually had a good run. You know, I think if it kept raining at Watkins Glen, definitely would have been uh, up there for the win. I think he had the best car in the rain. Uh, but then once it, you know, once it dried up, uh, he didn't have as much pace as Elliot and Larson. But you know, if he had won, you know, that would have sent everybody into, uh, you know, scrambling for, um, you know, the. 17th winner it would kick it would have kicked out um uh, ryan blaney and put them in desperation to try him because if you know ryan blaney wins next week then of course he's in right now he's still in but you know if he got kicked out and then won next week then he'd be back in because he's higher in points than michael mcdowell is but yeah it's it's just a very complicated system um that needs to be uncomplicated you know they've they fucked it and now they need to unfuck it so um you know to me to me they would like just uh you know make it the top 20 like if they're gonna have this winner in system that it should just be the top 20 in points rather than the top 30 because then there would be some legitimacy um because there's no way that a guy in 25th in points should have a ranking over over um you know somebody that's third in points with no wins because you know if you get lucky at talladega you know or uh any other track you know prior to prior to Daytona, or you get lucky at Daytona now that that's the closing regular season race. But if you get lucky at any of these restrictor play tracks or a fuel mileage win, and you're normally a 25th place points car, and that means you're somehow deserving of a championship over, you know, a guy who's been fairly consistent, but just hasn't won a race uh, all year that, yeah, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. So yeah, I think it, you know, definitely a 20th or cut it off at 20th place. And then I think top 12, uh, vie for the spot, which means that eight drivers see that that's a little bit more interesting because you have eight drivers who are you know somewhat mid level to mediocre or mediocre that um could potentially still get in, and you don't have anybody below that's uh you know completely middling otherwise that uh you know doesn't deserve a chance because you know I think you look past twentieth um um you know we'll we'll count Kurt Busch in this because um you know we'll we'll give him a pass on the the injury but you know. I, you could maybe make a case for, you know, somebody like Bubba Wallace making it into the playoffs um, if you cut it off at the top 20, which I think he's 20th in points right now. And that's still somewhat legitimate over, you know, um, Brad Keselowski or uh, Ricky Stenhouse or something like that. Um, you know, so um, that's, that's to me, that's what I would do. Of course, you know, we, if it was really up to me, we'd go back to um, – you know, the old format before the playoffs and just have the regular season win or, you know, be the whole year and then, you know, just reformat the points to make it so that winning races rewards the most points, you know, sort of like in, uh, you know, Formula One type system or something like that uh, there. But yeah, you have, you have that. And then also the stages, which, um, you know, that contrives things and overcomplicates things um, and of course affects the racing strategy in some way. We saw that at uh, Watkins Glen on Sunday, um, yeah, had a lot of great racing, you know, in the first stage and when it was wet and it was pretty intriguing, pretty compelling. And then, you know, you had to throw the stage yellow because it's mandatory. And it's like, well, sometimes you wish they didn't have that yellow, uh, there, you know, and it's just like when you have a, um, yellow at any other track, um, that's not a stage yellow, but you have good racing and then someone crashes. It's like, well, that just, you know, um, yeah, of course you get a restart and everything, which makes things artificially exciting. But then you also, um, on the other end, you had some really good legitimate racing going on between drivers and everything. But you know, it, it's all, it's all cause of TV and we're going to have how many like dozen drivers that are outside the top 16 and points trying to make it in at Daytona, um, that maybe only five or six could make a case for. And then, um, on top of that, you know, you, um, when it comes to the elimination rounds, you're going to have the guys that are stuck at, you know, 12th or below trying to race their way in the, you know, be racing for 15th and, uh, 15th spot trying to get in and, you know, trying to get in on points to make it into the next round. And it might be great. I mean, you know, it might be great racing like visually, which no problem with, but then on the other hand, the whole reason why the drama is there is because of some artificial system, you know, so there's that. And then, you know, of course, you know, you have the most successful drive of the year, of course, like we talked about 2020 was Kevin Harvick and um, somehow did not have a chance to compete for that title when, you know, probably should have, uh, you know, been the champion that year. If you go by points scored over the regular season and um, think that also, you know, if, if that happens again, 
um, you know, I think that also brings uh, or lo- makes the system lose a lot more credibility. Um, I mean, at least last year, Kyle Larson being the most successful driver that year actually did win the title. So it brings a little bit of credibility back there, but you know, um, you know, I think there was still a one up, race go off. Yeah, anyway. Still one race go off. You know, you, th- that's not really legitimate. So yeah, it's just, you know, I think going, let's tie it back to the international thing. Um, I think, uh, this kind of undermines that because then if you try to get international fans to get into this, um, they're going to have a hard time following it because, um, you know, there's going to be a lot of things to, to follow and, um, understand the format. And, you know, I've heard from, uh, other media outlets on YouTube saying that, you know, maybe NASCAR needs to reconsider this because it's ultimately making it overcomplicated and, and that maybe with the way things are with the racing on the track, with this new car, that maybe, um, we can get rid of that and just have the racing and have everything fall uh, behind that. So um, I think, I think I'll ultimately to outreach that maybe we have to modify this again or, you know, abolish it entirely to, um, you know, be able to grow beyond the uh, NASCAR current NASCAR fan base, I guess. Yeah. If you, if you're really trying to get new people in that, or um, I guess a little higher, level crowd i mean granted you know where we're at with formula one with with a lot of lewis fans and verse most of verstappen's fan base no offense to my buddy tom downey but you know most of his fellow max fans are pretty retarded and um and i say that as somebody who works with people with disabilities so it's bad but whatever um and lewis fans are are an interesting sort as well um and I say that as somebody who's been a fan of his since 2007. Um, it's the same thing with Larson, Elliott, whatever, and Kyle Busch and some of those bases. The sport has moved. I get it. It's moved to a different place since BZF took it over. And a lot of what BZF did during his time has made this thing worse. You have an opportunity. You've made some changes that are good. This car is good. He's on drugs, too. I mean, this guy, yeah. this guy's a, you know admitted drug addict and yeah. you know everything and his decision making while on drugs you know potentially affected the entire sport no they've lost a ton of they've lost a ton of money i mean the only thing that's really kept them afloat is you know fox and espn abc and freaking nbc paying ridiculous amounts of money to go and put on commercials every 10 laps that's that's a uh, part of it um there's also the notion of, um, you know, I think with the way that the sport went with all these contrived gimmicks that they've had uh, because they're so desperate for fans because they can't explain how to make a 500 mile race and how it is. The point is it worked just fine when Bob, Benny and Ned did it. It worked just fine when Mike Joy was working with uh, with Neil Bonnet, the late Neil Bonnet, God bless his soul, and late Buddy Baker, God bless his soul. And, you know, you know, we're, you know, Bob Jenkins and, you know, and uh, Betty Parsons, all God bless all of them. You know, they had no problem explaining these races and Ken Squire, you know, they didn't have a problem explaining these races and you know what people watched. And generally speaking, the, the crowds were pretty darn good and the racing wasn't horrible and they didn't have to set artificial cautions and they didn't have to do all these things and come up with playoffs points and stage points and God dang it. You know, somebody would put a good car together and win the race. That's what's happened on a lot of these road courses this year. Um, Clyde did it. He's done it a, a bunch before. That's why he's won a bunch of road courses. Tyler Reddick's done it the last two road courses. You know, there's been days when that happens. That's what racing is. And we're about to get into a racing series that allows that to happen because that's what racing is about. Um, we'll talk about Cup. We'll talk about Daytona next week. Uh, Josh will be at the race. We'll have Joe Passero on. So um, get ready for a good, long GSP in episode 131. We always seem to do that when the three of us are all together. So um, we'll uh, have another long one leading you into your um, week, the week before uh, Labor Day weekend. So that'll be nice. But another thing that we'll be talking about next weekend is IndyCar because uh, this past weekend's race was uh, really, really good. At uh, Worldwide Technology Raceway Gateway, 
uh, which saw Joseph Newgarden win for the fifth time in 2022. Newgarden has been on a heater this year. Uh, his teammate, Will Power, led the most laps. Then uh, Joseph Newgarden led the second most laps. So it was a Penske benefit. It's a track. I mean, it's hard to find a track that Penske isn't good at in an IndyCar because it's Penske series. It's IndyCar, et cetera, et cetera. But my goodness, he has uh, quite a battle on his hands. Will Power, of course, tied the great Mario Andretti with a hundred with 67 poles led a bunch of laps uh led the first 58 laps of the race then led another 61 laps after uh pit stops so essentially led his 128 laps over the first whatever yeah he led the vast majority of his race in the first 123 laps of the race and then uh got a few more laps led there uh in the middle then Joseph Newgarden appeared, and that's when things kind of changed. Um, Newgarden wins over David Malukas and Scott McLaughlin. The battle at the end was between Newgarden and Scott McLaughlin, the teammates. Pato Award finishes fourth. A uh, former winner at Gateway, Takuma Sato, finishes fifth. So Dale Coyne's team gets two cars in the top five. Uh, sandwiching three Chevy cars, being sandwiched around a bunch of Chevy cars, all three Penske's, and the and then uh, Pato's uh, Arrow McLaren car. Then three cheap Ganassi cars: Marcus Erickson, Scott Dixon, Alex Palou, and Green Rehall, rounding out the top ten. Uh, he was the last car on the lead lap. So, uh, what is it? Three, six, seven, eight, eight, yeah. 8, 9, 10. 10 guys led in this race on Saturday night. They, unlike NASCAR, they moved the race start up to avoid uh, rain. Uh, they got 210 laps in or thereabouts. You know, they got 200, it says 214 laps in or 213 laps in before the rain came in. They had air titans at St. Louis, drive the track, got the race in. I guess IndyCar seems to have a better idea of what even and with the tight TV windows that NBC provides uh, for IndyCar, uh, they were able to get the full race in and do it in a reasonable time. Uh, But Joseph Newgarden winning is now three points behind his teammate, Will Power. Uh, I mean, Will Power has been the most consistent driver this year. Uh, He has the best average finish of 6.4. His qualifying, with all, even with all the polls that he's had this year, I mean, he's uh, Will is at four polls this year, but his average starts actually only a third, fourth, a sixth. But he has four polls, so that's the most polls amongst uh, everybody. Uh, he's ran at the finish of more races than any driver this year. He's tied, or uh, I'm sorry, I, I I'm. There's three guys that have finished 15 races this year. He's one of them. Scott Dixon is another one, and then Connor Daly. So there's three guys that have finished uh, 15 races out of 15. Those are those three. Uh, He is three points out of his teammate. Scott Dixon's 14 points behind in third. Marcus Erickson, the Indianapolis 500 champion, is fourth, 17 points behind. Palo, the defending series champion, is fifth, 43 back. Scott McLaughlin, after a podium, another podium, is sixth of the year. Is sixth in points and uh, 54 back in Pato Award is seventh, 58 back. Those are the guys that are still in this, really. And it's going to get to the point where essentially it'll be four guys if things kind of stay the way things are uh, going into after Portland, going into Laguna Seca. But strong race at Gateway. Joseph Newgarden trying to get three championships and um, he's putting himself in a place to really do that. Josh Um, getting one for his baby. Now that he has, now he's a dad. I think he's got that dad energy going now. Five wins. He wanted to win in Nashville. Didn't go well. He was really pissed there. And now uh, he was pissed because he's still not leading the points, but he's got Ryan Newman energy going on now. Uh, it's like circa 2003 when we won all those races and didn't matter. But uh, the difference is I think Joseph Newgarden might be able to close this deal out, uh, even with Will Power 
qualifying prowess. Yeah, I think for Joe Newgarden, he's got a you know he's got five wins now, so he's needs to win again or finish better than Will Power uh, at Portland and then Laguna Seca, and then I think the the title's his. But yeah, this was a you know interesting race that played out because um, you know, first Will Power was uh, very dominant during the daylight, of course, and then um, I think you know all the way up until uh, the the weather started acting up. I mean, this was basically Will Power's race, uh, but then um, you know pit strategy deferred, and then Joseph Newgarden basically found himself out out in front um, with you know the last restart, and then he was able to hold off uh, his teammate uh, and Scott McLaughlin and, you know, was able to hold them off there. Um, it was a really great battle between those two with the last 40 laps. Um, Scott McLaughlin, you know, was maybe within uh, a second of him the whole way. And, you know, he's had to navigate traffic um, and Scott McLaughlin was able to still keep, uh, you know, still keep up with him. But, you know, for Joseph Newgarden, um, it's a, a, dominant win and you know furthers his case uh to you know to be the, the champion this year and you know it's it's very possible now with uh only being three points back in the title and you know we to go back to our point about nascar and the playoffs i mean look at indycar's playoffs or standings here it, you know you have four drivers that are within 17 points and tell me that's not exciting you know, you, you didn't, they didn't need Evan a, a within playoff. 58 and no playoff. Yeah. And that's no been playoff. the case for, this has been going back. I don't know how far you have been, how far back you go with IndyCar, but I can remember whatever this series, even before they merged, there was the Dario Franchitti, Scott Dixon battle in 2007. So that's 15 years ago. It's almost like every year, this is what it ends up being. And it organically happens. The points are kind of wonky in IndyCar, but honestly, it always presents this. There's double points at Indianapolis. That's why by uh, by Erickson's in it after Dixon should have won. Could you imagine if Dixon had actually won the Indy 500? This may not even be a conversation right now. Like, that's the thing. It's crazy. Like, Will Power would always be that guy that would um, go and have his issues. This year, he's been more consistent than he's ever been in his whole entire life, qualifying just as good as he's always done. He only has one win. He's he's doing the D- Dale Earnhardt, Matt Kenseth thing, and I, I that's my thing in my head with the old NASCAR point system because Jeff Green posted a picture of his old Nesquik uh, Chevrolet from his championship year uh, on his Twitter and I tweeted him, and he liked my post, um, so it reminded me of that. That's essentially what Will Power is doing. Because if he had, if he had had that same mentality when he lost those championships to Dario, he'd have probably beaten Dario for one of them. He wouldn't have beaten them both of them, but he, he would have beaten Dario at least once. But yeah, you, I, I just wanted to add, add that in. I apologize, but I, no, I no, just you're, think of that. I I agree with you there, and I mean, I think this this had some good racing in it too, because. I'm um, talking about Newgarden and McLaughlin. Um, Newgarden made a very bold move, uh, yeah, you know, on the final restart and passed him on the outside uh, to take the you know take the lead uh, for the uh, for, you know eventual win. So uh, you know that it there was a lot of great racing there, and um, McLaughlin had a chance towards the end, but um, just couldn't get through traffic as good as Newgarden. And then he also had to deal with. Uh, David McLu- Lucas, who also you know had good tire strategy and was able to be in position thanks to his team, they uh, they had good tires and you know they were able to um, use them to their benefit. And we may be talking about a different winner here if um, he had maybe ventured out onto the outside lane, um, you know, a few laps earlier once he got up to for, or first got up to um, Scott McLaughlin there because you know he didn't pass him on the outside until like maybe the last. Uh, the last lap, I believe, or two laps to go for uh, Malukas to overtake uh, in the second. But, um, you know, that was a pretty pretty interesting aspect there um, just between the, the tire strategy between the teams and then also the strategy to go out, out in front because um, I think the way that got set up was uh, Newgarden and McLaughlin were on a different strategy and Will Power, Paddle Award were on a different strategy. Um, then they, they kind of diverged and then, um, you know, ended up with uh, power uh, restarting mid-pack or not mid-pack but in like fourth place and that gave the opportunity for 
uh, Newgarden and, and McLaughlin to battle it out. But um, yeah, this was a you know this was an exciting race. I think for for any car, um, you know the uh, I think the interesting part of it was of course the the weather, um, which um, you know I think they they didn't have to end this race or you know stay you know stay as long as they did. They could have I think they could have cut the race short. They decided to hang it out for the fans and for everybody else, uh, and they wanted to settle the race uh, and you know race the final 40, 43 laps of that event. So you know, give credit to IndyCar for you know figuring out how to get the race in and you know give give the fans what they came there, what they paid came to see. So um, you know, and even with the constraints of the TV window alongside of that, so you know give them credit uh, for being able to get that all in. And you know, give us um, the great racing that we saw there at Gateway. Yeah, and Curtis Francois, everybody at uh, Worldwide Technology Gateway uh, Motorsports Park. There, uh, credit to them for yet again providing a great experience. It's a it's a bucket list uh, track for me to go to, whether for the for the Cup Xfinity Truck Weekend, but more likely the IndyCar Weekend. Unless you know, maybe they can move it off of Watkins Glen. But well, let's be fair. I'm not going to go to Watkins Glen NASCAR Weekend. It's it's for the six hours. I'm going to make that happen next year. It has to happen uh, because there's going to be all the new GTP cars. It's a justification just to go. Um, great weekend again. Great racetrack. One of the best racetracks best run racetracks in this country um we almost lost that track but good people that want to invest have done a great job put on great racing now you have the two biggest series in america uh, at this track and you have two great events um and so that's that's the thing and now 58.7 drivers two races to go we will preview portland next week on the gsp uh we went over all the Cup stuff, uh, failed to mention. We'll just reverse back before the roundup. Uh, there really isn't, I mean, to me, there really isn't a whole lot to go into. The The race was essentially Will Byron and Ty Gibbs in the Xfinity, the Sunoco Go Rewards 200, which is only eight laps shorter than the Cup race. Uh, but the uh, Byron qualified on pole, Gibbs was in second. They dominated the race. They led, what is it? He had led 60 of the, uh, or seven, yeah, 320, yeah, yeah, 60 of the, of the 82 laps. And, um, it was really amongst those guys. Sammy Smith won his first stage of his, uh, Xfinity career. He should have probably won the ARCA race, got used up by, uh, Tanner Gray or Tyler Gray or whatever the hell the other Gray brother is. Um, William Byron won the second stage. Uh, Gibbs and Byron use each other up in the in the inner loop. It seems like the uh, inner loop was where all the action was this weekend. A lot of the, or a lot of the action was. Uh, Connor Rose, yeah. So Larson wins in the eighty eight car. Almendinger second, Smith third, Gagson fourth. Kaz Grala gets a top five for um, big machine records or big McKine records. If you are a Baba Bui person. Sam Mayer, 6th, Riley Herb 7th, Sheldon Creed, 8th, Josh Berry, ninth, Jeremy Clements, 10th, in a nice-looking uh, uh, throwback-type scheme in his 51 car. Uh, Herbst is actually the best uh, points person that is, hasn't won a race this year, so that's crazy to think, considering how bad Riley Herbst has been in his career. Um, Grala gets his first top five in the Xfinity Series. Uh Creed is essentially the only person that could flirt with making it in on points. He's only 39 points back. Uh, Custer, Stefan Parsons gets a good finish. Uh, top 15, Sieg, who is in 12th, lost points to Sheldon Creed there. Timmy Hill started tailback, finished 14th. Connor Mozak had a bad pit stop late, but was still able to get back to 15th. Landing Castle, who is running for points, doesn't have hasn't had great year. Josh Balicki was making lots of cheese related jokes <clears throat> uh, on his Twitter. Andy Lally got a top twenty, and of course Brad Bread Perez, who I've I got his shirt from his debut last year in the um, Arca series. Hope he'll make another shirt for his Xfinity uh, debut. 
uh, yesterday on Saturday. I'll go and get that one because he did a good job to go and make the show and get a top 20 finish ahead of Preston Partis, who's a um, pretty good road racer. Um, yeah, so, I mean, uh, there, this race, I, we talked about it last week, Josh. We thought a cup guy was going to win. We figured it was going to be one of them Hendrick guys. Uh, the fact that Larson won, essentially picking up the pieces, not really that surprising. And combining it in regards to the points battle, that we have in the Xfinity series uh, as it stands right now. Um, they, uh, uh, as I mentioned, AJ Allmendinger has now has a 61 point lead on Ty Gibbs and Justin Allgaier who wrecked early finished dead last lost a ton of points. Uh, he wrecked four laps into the race. So lost a ton of points and uh, is now 70 points behind Gagson's 99 back. Josh Berry's 118 points out. So you just imagine how in the Cup Series right now, there's 118 points or thereabouts to to Elliott and Larson. There's few people that are ahead of him, but the fact of the matter is right now, A.J. Allmendinger, that run he had on this weekend, what he did this weekend, might have been the, the thing that gives him a chance to win this regular season title uh josh uh since we're getting into right now we have four more races counting this weekend at daytona this coming friday at daytona four more races to go he could start dumping points honestly he could he could finish 20th the next three weeks or around 15th if he can run 15th the next f- four weeks he's still gonna make He's still going to win the regular season title. And that is huge for a guy who has only really shown his stuff on road courses in A.J. Allmendinger so far this year. Yeah, I mean, this was a very critical race for A.J. Allmendinger to be able to uh, solid, you know, finish solidly. Uh, of course, he didn't win the Xfinity race, came up just short behind Kyle Larson uh, on Saturday. But, uh, you know, A.J. was able to... Uh, do what he needed to do to not, you know, give up the race and uh, preserve his uh, championship uh, run here. But on the flip side, um, going, you know, going back to um, the main contenders in this race, you know, you had William Byron, who, of course, um, running a one-off in Hendrick Motorsports, and uh, Ty Gibbs also, uh, you know, doing double duty that weekend. But Ty Gibbs um, had a, you know, he had a good car. Uh, William Byron also had a good car, but they got into it in the bus stop. Uh, Kyle Larson was there as well. Uh, thought better of going three wide, uh, going into the bus stop chicane. But then uh, William Byron and Ty Gibbs both spin each other out, and that gives Kyle Larson the opportunity to go ahead and uh, take the win. So uh, Larson, of course, we talked about him earlier in the Cup Series. Uh, on Saturday wins on the first day, so wins in the number 88 and you know gives... Junior Motorsports, another win on the season as a team, um, you know, uh, goes to show the preparation that they get for their cars and everything. But, um, you know, the Xfinity Series point standings, of course, uh, Ty Gibbs, of course, him getting spun out and uh, losing the race did not help him in being able to uh, you know, make a charge for the regular season title and hurts his chances on, on that front, although he's got plenty of wins already on the year. Uh, compared to everybody else, so um, it's not a necessity to win, but of course it does help to win to get into that uh, regular season title, give you a little bit more cushion than what you already have uh, with playoff points and wins uh, to go on on the year. So uh, those are you know those things to consider in the Xfinity series, but um, this was uh, you know I think the racing there was also exceptionally good, uh, just like it was on Sunday uh, for. Uh, Xfinity at Watkins Glen um, uh, uh, did not, you know, I, I didn't expect William Byron to go out and dominate like he did uh, on Sunday or on Saturday for Xfinity. Um, I don't really normally think of him as a road course guy, but uh, Hendrick Motorsports, obviously, they did a good job preparing uh, their number 17 car that they've created a one off uh, for uh, for those guys. Uh, to get their their cup guys more experience uh, with uh, the uh, road courses on the schedule that we have left, uh, so that you know they can uh, continue to perform better in the cup side. Which obviously for Kyle Larson this helped him uh, because he 
um, was able to go out and win on Sunday. But you know, there's a lot of other guys in this uh, series as well that uh, performed uh, exceptionally well. Uh, Sammy Smith, of course, uh, finishing in third place, uh, who, you know, he's um, kind of on the up and coming as well. And he was able to get out and get a good finish and led, led a handful of six laps in this race. Uh, so it was only his fourth start and, you know, got his first career Xfinity top 10, top five. Uh, so that's a good, good race for a young driver like that. Uh, Kaz Grala, of course, also finishing in fifth place. Uh, and he had a, had a good run for, for that team, uh, for the big machine records team. Um, Sheldon Creed, of course, trying to get into the playoffs. Um, still, still not quite in it. Uh, still got a long ways to go, but a good top 10 finish, uh, uh, helps him to be able to get to the, um, you know, potentially get into the, uh, crack the top 12, uh, there, but, um, yeah, th this, um, uh, you know, this race was, uh, a little, little bit interesting, maybe not as, uh, as flashy as the cup race with the brain and everything, but still there's a lot of solid action. You still got a unexpected finish, of course, uh, with, uh, Byron and, and Ty Gibbs getting into it on, uh, the, you know, after the final restart. Yeah. And I think this weekend's Xfinity race, we're going to get into it. I th will be, uh, spicier. And then you have Bristol coming up. You have Darlington, which I mean, to be fair, is a junior motorsports track, Darlington, Bristol is somewhat of a wild card. That's the cutoff for the, uh, regular season, uh, championship there. The regular season title will be determined at Bristol. So, uh, Daytona is a wild card. Bristol is a wild card of sorts on on the concrete, and then Darlington is a junior motorsports track. the The one and a half mile track probably is more of a junior motorsports or a Ty Gibbs type of track. So that's what we're going to see. Hopefully, as we get into the next four weeks of the Xfinity series, there ain't going to be. Um, there will be. Um, they're they're running out the rest of the year now. They had their last off week, the Xfinity series. So they're gonna be running five, yeah, eight, eleven, twelve weeks in a row. So they'll be with the Cup series the rest of the year. Um running. So we'll see the Xfinity series every week. Uh getting it around up here uh this weekend. Uh had NHRA at uh Brainerd, the fuel categories the uh, the nitro categories ran steve torrens gets his first win of 22 the four-time defending champion of the top fuel uh series 52 wins now for steve torrens he beats tony schumacher the eight-time top fuel champion so plenty of championships amongst those two assholes um that's that's lovely uh yeah and then uh Tony, what is it? Brittany Force had the low ET of the meets at 364 of the six. Josh Hart, 334.73. Best uh, speed of the weekend. Brittany Force lost to Steve Torrance in a pedal fest in the semifinals. Tony Schumacher, even though Justin Ashley had a killer reaction time against them, smoked, uh, Ashley smoked the tires. Schumacher ran a 433. Uh, still had lane choice. Didn't matter um in the finals uh the uh funny car highlights for them bob tasca gets yet another win he's on a heater right now doing great work uh with his uh program his ford mustang program uh, ron caps ran against him he got really lucky uh, after the first round he bobby Bodie had issues mechanical issues and then Caps smoked the tires if Bodie doesn't have those mechanical issues, probably advances, which would have meant he would have made the finals since Alexis DeJoria red lit like by a country mile. Tasca goes and gets yet another victory there. Uh, in yeah, they don't have the yeah, pro stock motorcycle and pro mod or pro stock car and pro stock motorcycle didn't run this past weekend. Tricky Ricky Smith wins in pro mod over Doug Winters. 579 with a two just over just under 251 miles an hour 250.92 in the pro mod category There's a little bit of uh drama there with stuff that uh tricky ricky smith he's like 180 years old he's still at it god bless him uh he used to run the stp pontiac in the pro stocks so 
Gotta love Tricky Ricky. His son, Matt Smith, has won all them pro stock motorcycle titles, and they're all still around doing great work. So going into the U.S. Nationals here in a couple weeks' time, four drivers are locked in to the playoff, their countdown. Brittany Force has a 94-point lead on Mike Salinas, 130 on Steve Torrance, 136 on Justin Ashley. Those four are all locked in. Uh, essentially, once some of these cars make qualifying runs, uh, they will get locked in. They will. Um, the way it works is if you go and run essentially two out of three qualifying runs at every race and you show up every week, you will make the playoffs. So as it stands, there will be 12 cars that make it into the top fuel playoff. Uh, I mean, Josh Hart, Sean Langdon, Leah Pruitt. Et cetera, et cetera, Schumacher, Coletta, Antron Brown right now is in by uh, 29 points over Clay Milliken, his buddy, and tied, and they're also tied with Austin Prox. So yeah, that's a little bit of a battle there, points wise, in top field. In Funny Car, the top nine are locked in to the the countdown now. Robert Height has, is going to win the regular season. He's 250 points ahead of Matt Hagen, Ron Capps. It's third, Tasca fourth, John Forrest fifth, J.R. Todd, Alexis DeJoria, Cruz Pentagon, and Tim Wilkerson. Uh, those are the nine. Chad Green is four points ahead of Jim Campbell. And then he's 26 points in front of Blake Alexander. So uh, that's where those guys, I think the Campbell and Alexander would make it in uh, to the playoff based on what I understand uh, since they've run every every race. Uh, so that'll be something to look at at uh, at Indianapolis. The top four are locked in in pro stock. They didn't run this past weekend. Enders, Aaron Stanfield, Kyle Koretsky, Greg Anderson. Uh, you have Troy Coughlin Jr., who's on a recent run, won a couple races in a row. Dallas Glenn, Mason McGahey, Camry Caruso. The only driver that I think is not affiliated with either a lead or, or uh, what do you call them? Um, K, whatever, KB Racing. So uh, that would be something. Uh, Hartford, Bo Butner. The points between Matt Hartford, ninth to Derek Kramer, it's only 50 points, and they have points and a half at, at uh, Indianapolis. You have Quadras that is only about 30, what is it, 36 points behind that. And I think that's really where that, I mean, they'll probably break it down a little better there. The top eight are locked in in Pro Stock Motorcycle. Joey Gladstone leads by 64 points over Angel Sampe. Eddie Krawick is third, Steve Johnson fourth. So Suzuki's are the top four. Matt Smith is swapping between his Buell and his Suzuki. He's in fifth. Angie Smith is in sixth. Jerry Savoy seventh. Karen Stouffer eighth. So was it one, two, three, four former champions are locked in to the playoff here. Ing Mark Ingwerson, Ryan Ayler is the cutoff right now. He's seven points ahead of Jimmy Underdahl. After that, Chris Bostick is nearly uh was he ninety points back? And then uh, Kelly Klontz is over 100. He's a, or she's 109 points back. Gianna Salinas is 111 out. That's really where the those are where the battle is in regards to that. For the NHRA, we'll get back into it a couple weeks' time, U.S. Nationals, and um, preview that for everybody here on the GSP. Let's go and do that right over there. Good. Austrian Grand Prix last weekend uh, for MotoGP. They were Red Bull Ring, which saw Peko Bagnaia win for a third consecutive race over Fabio Quattararo. Ducatis, it's a Ducati track. They always say it's a Ducati track. Uh, four Ducatis in the top five uh, saw Qua Bagnaia, Quattararo, was the only non Ducati in there? Miller, the so two factory Ducatis there in the top on the podium. Luca Marini for uh, Valentino Rossi's team, fourth. Johan Zarco for Pramac uh, finishes fifth. Alicia Spargro finishes sixth. Uh, El Plan was sitting in his uh, uh, 
uh, garage stall. So that's interesting. Uh, Brad Binder, former winner at Red Bull Ring. Uh, Alex Rins, Marco Besecchi on the other um, Valentino Rossi uh, team, Ducati in ninth, and Jorge Martin and the other Pramac Ducati in 10th. Fabio DJ Antonio 11th. Oliveira, Vinales, Ox Marquez, Davizioso. First Honda finishes 15th. Pola Spargo. Uh, so he'll be happy to get off of that bike for sure. Uh, Joanne Muir crashed out in the first lap. Anea Bestaini uh, had had to retire six laps in. Nakagami, Darren Binder, Franco Morbidelli's nightmare season. Um, la- crashed with three laps to go there. So their next race will be in San Marino at uh, Misano, I think. Uh, that's in yeah, Misano. Uh, where um, or Marco Simoncelli, whatever the the track. I think that's the Marco Simoncelli track. Uh, Quattararo is up by thirty two points over Alex Spargaro. Peko Bagnaya with uh, another victory. He's won three races in a row. The last um, just have to scroll here. I'm trying to unaggressively scroll. Yeah, can't really do that. The last five point scores he has had are, or six point scores are victories. Yeah, that's that's what it is. Uh, three, no, no, five. Yeah, last five times he has scored points, he's won. But he's had three non points scores in that in in between that. So uh, three in the in the last eight races. So he's won five of the last eight races. Three non point scores. And he started the year really, really poorly with an eighth, um, two fifths, and a fifteenth. So that's really why he's behind. That's a big reason why he's behind Fabio Quattararo. Quattararo's only had one non-point score this year, and when he doesn't, uh, he's won. What is it? Three times. He finishes on the podium. He's uber consistent, even though the Yamaha is not a great bike. Um, he has done really good work with it. Uh, when it comes to the points, I mean, you have one Aprilia there. And then after the Aprilia of Espargaro, you have four Ducatis, KTM, Alex Rins on a Suzuki, a Ducati, Miguel Oliveira with Jorge Martin, then Oliveira on a KTM. And then um, Vinales, Aprilia, Mir on a Suzuki, having a rough year this year, former world champion, um, moving to Honda. Both Suzuki riders are moving to Honda. Joanne Mir moving to Repsol Honda. And then um, Alex Rins moving to the um, uh, Honda satellite team with uh, he's, uh, yeah with LCR Honda. He'll be moving with LCR Honda next year so that's interesting how that whole dynamic is uh oh man um yeah there's yeah i mean you're you're talking about the next best yamaha rider after uh fabio quattararo's franco morbidelli who is 19th in points he only has 26 points on the year and he hasn't scored a point in um he's had i mean he scores points at the back end of the grid he's essentially where the hondas are which is crazy so it tells you how this bike essentially is like good enough for one rider and not good for anybody else Uh, a crazy thing to see uh ducati of course leads the constructors or teams championship over aprilia then yamaha and pramac constructors ducati's gonna win that's that's without a that's no argument there everybody and their mother know that's gonna happen um, moto two is standings from last race the moto two race saw ayagura win over somcat chantra jackson in third uh, costa and aguso fernandez your top five cameron bobier 13th joe roberts 14th so they both score points so that's cool um Celestino Vietti uh retires Lorenzo Della Porta Tony Arbolino Lorenzo Della Porta Tony Arbolino uh get in a wreck with each other uh, Sean Dillon Kelly in a wreck with Kemnith Kubo five laps into the race 
So brutal for him. The points going into San Marino. Ayagura has taken the points lead over Augusto Fernandez by one point. A Celestino Vietti is in third. He's run into a rough patch uh, here recently. Uh, Augusto Fernandez had three wins in a row before his fifth place last this past weekend. Uh, Ayagura second, third, and second, fourth, and first in the last three races uh, has helped him there. Joe Roberts is now four, fifth in points, but uh, tied with Tony Arbolino and Jake Dixon. So that's good to see. But he's uh, 29 points behind Aaron Kinnett. Some cat chart. Chantra is now ninth. Uh, Cameron Bobier is 17th in points, a point behind Manuel Gonzalez. Uh, essentially, I mean, if you're looking at uh, trying to get in the top 10, he's 45 points behind Pedro Acosta in that battle. And then uh, Sean Dillon Kelly is still 29th in points. The uh, supercars that sit down race last week there and what used to be the uh Sandown 500 um uh, we got Michael Massey who's going to be moving over there so god bless supercars who fuck that shit up and give it to Holden uh race 1 saw Will Davison win over Shane Van Gisbergen and uh Davison's DJR teammate Anton Di Pasquale in third Will Brown Cam Waters your top 5 Race two, SVG over Chaz Mostert, Will Brown, David Reynolds, Scott Pye. Race three, SVG over Will Davison, Brock Feeney, uh, Van Gisbergen's teammate, finishes third, Chaz Mostert, Mark Winterbottom, your top five. So the next race is a few weeks away at Pukekohe. Uh, the points see Shane Van Gisbergen up by, uh, was it, 200 28 yeah 228 points ahead of Anton Di Pasquale he's 250 or so 252 points ahead of Will Davison that's the battle uh there's only x amount of rounds ago Bathurst if if one of the DJR cars can win Bathurst that could go and change things up a little bit we'll see what happens with that uh three uh three uh races well not three total races but like three rounds are left pukukoi bathurst and then uh the finale which will be the at adelaide first time in a few years so adelaide is back on the supercars calendar so that's huge cam waters uh chas monster your top five in supercars points uh going into the f2 series you have um, Felipe Drogovic has a 21-point lead on Teo Pocher, who's had a great couple of races prior to um, the summer break. 45 total points in in um, Paul Ricard and at Hungary. He uh, has now brought the gap back to 21. Logan Sargent was on a heater prior to France and Hungary. He was scoring points in bunches and gotten past Teo Pocher. Uh, but the last two weekends have only netted him four points, which is, is horrendous. He's still third, though. Um, Enzo Fittipaldi is 80 points out of the lead in fourth. J- Jahan Deruvla is fifth, but that's a pretty tight battle, essentially, from Enzo Fittipaldi all the way to Yuri Vips is only 15 points. So there's a lot of room there with the current format. There's still eight total races to go this season. Uh, there's They're going to run the three consecutive weekends, European weekends, and then they'll be holding off to Abu Dhabi for the end of the season. So this uh, time is huge for them. Formula 3 is uh, also back this this weekend at uh, at uh, Belgium, they'll be running. There's this next three race uh, uh, three race weekends. They'll run. That's the end of their season. So six races to go in their championship. Isaac Hadjar is tied with Victor Martins for the points lead. Artur Leclerc is nine points back. Uh, American Jack Crawford, Red Bull 
junior driver is 24 points out in fourth along with Oliver Bierman. Um, Roman Stanek, the 31, 35 points back in sixth. So you, you, you look at the amount of points you can get in a race weekend and um, you have the sprint race and you have the feature race. There's some opportunities there. Um, you know, you got Kush Miney's 30s, 12th in points. Juan Manuel Correa, 13th. Kalen Frederick, 14th. Uh, amongst those American drivers and in, in Kushmani Indian drivers. And um, yeah, Brad Benavides, Hunter Yaney, he's another one. Um, so we'll see what happens this weekend. Three weekends to go. They're going to be racing back to back to back. So F2, F3, uh, it's going to come up quick. And after this European triple, their season's going to be over. So they're going to have some downtime. If you go and come through, if you get hot here at the end of the season, it could really net some great results and could get you in a Formula 2 if you have the right uh, right funding, honestly. Uh, IMSA GT at uh, VIR this coming weekend. There'll be uh, just uh, GT Pro, GTD Pro, and GTD category. Uh, we'll be racing second time this year that that's been the case. Lime Rock was the other one. Five cars in GTD Pro. Corvette of Antonio Garcia, Jordan Taylor, Matt, Matt Campbell, Matthew Jaminet, Faf Motorsports, Plaid Porsche, Jack Har- Hawksworth, Ben Barnacote, and Vassar Sullivan Lexus. Ross Gunn, Alex Riberos, Harder Racing, Aston Martin, and then Connor D. Filippi, John Edwards, BMW M Team, ALL as the great lead, lead, if you would say. And then 13 entries in the GT Daytona category. New Jersey's Paul Miller Racing uh, starts the race on Sunday. They will win the Sprint Cup. Brian Sellers, Madison Snow get that, so that'll be cool. That'll be great for them. They're a good team. Great combination. Madison Snow had to, quote, retire, end quote, for a year so he could maintain his silver ranking telling you how the whole ranking metal system is uh, i think they're going to make some changes to make it a little different so we'll, we'll see what happens with that uh frankie Montecalvo, aaron tielitz and the vassar Sullivan lexus ryan hardwick jan hill and the Wright motorsports porsche roman d'angelis maxine martin hard racing aston martin mike skeen steven mcalear team korthoff mercedes robin mcginnis jeff westfall carbon with pen Pair Green Racing Lamborghini, Jaden Conright, Marco Holzer, NTSSR Lamborghini. And you got Gas Monkey Garage on their team, so that's nice. John Potter, Andy Lally, Magnus Racing, uh, Aston after racing in the Cup Series. Andy Lally back to his regular job. Uh, Ryan Eversley and Aiden Reed and Rick Ware Racing, Nurtech Acura. Russell Ward, Philip Ellis, Windward Racing, Mercedes. Cooper McNeil, Jewel Gunyan, WeatherTech Racing, Mercedes, Robbie Foley, Bill Oberlin, Turner Motorsports, BMW, and then Rob Ferriol, Catherine Legg, Team Hardpoint, Porsche 911, rounding out the grid. 18 cars for the race on Sunday at VIR. There will also be um, racing within the... um, you got those things. So they're talking about FAF Motorsports, five straight motors, podium results. Windward um, would be a strength of back-to-back GTD uh, wins if they, they had an issue at Lime Rock Park. So Windward Racing is on a heater. Consecutive podium finishes Lime Rock Road America. They had issues, of course, at Watkins Glen got destroyed by LMP3s, which is why they're a little bit behind in the point standings. So there is that going into um, this race uh, this coming weekend at Virginia National Raceway, one of the best racetracks on planet Earth. Uh, we will preview Formula One. It's been a while, Josh. Uh, they've been off for their summer break, but Formula One's coming in fast and furious here for the rest of the season. Nine rounds to go. To be honest, we know that uh, Max Verstappen is going to win the world championship more than likely, and um, it's uh, 
you know, the the constructors is also determined at least for the win for the top team. But Spa is one of the uh, greatest circuits on earth. There's a lot of rain uh, in the forecasts, kind of like Daytona, uh, Zandvoort, and Monza is the next three races. They'll have a break, then they're going to run three more races, another break, then they'll run two races, a break, and then so three break, three break two break and two so this this series is uh gonna be coming fast and furious as during the football season no less so um the um the this season uh, three three yeah break and then two and then break and then three three break, yeah so um I mean, are we going to see anything other than Max Verstappen winning this weekend? I don't think we are uh, per- personally, but uh, what are you seeing for uh, the the Belgian Grand Prix? You won this race after they only ran. They ran this race last year. They ran three laps last year um, due to the weather conditions, and they called it a race. Um, and um, essentially, it was everybody held their positions. So Max Verstappen won the Belgian Grand Prix over George Russell, and I don't remember who finished third, honestly, um, because the race was so... um, It wasn't even a race. It wasn't a race, so... But do do you see, like, as long as they run this, as long as they run this one out, or or do you really see anybody other than Max Verstappen winning this race? I mean, personally, I don't see one, but, you know, I picked something different on the grid talk, but I did it just for entertainment purposes. It's it's Max Verstappen, in my opinion, but what is yours? Yeah, I mean, I think um, Max Verstappen, more than likely, probably win this race. Um, it's, yeah, hard, hard to argue against it. Um, you have to see what, you know, Ferrari has left on the table uh, coming out of the break. Um I think you know they have the best chance of uh, of the you know the rest of the field to try and beat Red Bull and beat Verstappen but um you know right now Verstappen's got the hot hand um you know he's been quick all year they've had the pace um you know for the most part strategy strategy has been good um you know all left there is to do is for the driver to not make any mistakes and you know right now Verstappen hasn't made any mistakes and you know when when he I guess has made a mistake like you know in in Hungary he spun out and came back to win the race so uh it's a you know a tough deal right now for anybody else besides him uh and really anybody else outside of Red Bull but you know um very curious to see if Ferrari can you know bring something here if um you know they don't actually mess up on the strategy um that would be interesting um but to see and then you know also let's talk about mercedes um you know they've they've had a a lot of improvement since the beginning of the year um you know they've been able to um get uh lewis hamilton a little bit better form here he's been getting podiums you know he's had that run where he's gotten podiums lately um and george russell's right there alongside him um and of course you know george russell's coming up on the first place where he got a podium in, in Formula One driving last year for Williams, albeit was in the rain, but we, you know, celebrate that fact, I guess. And, um, you know, can George Russell come out here and maybe he can get another podium and actually get one for real this time, although he's already had several uh, ones that he's gotten for real uh, so far this year. But, hey, come back to the spot where you got first one and get a podium um, there. That would be interesting to see as well. Um, and then I think, you know, the rest of the field, um, be curious to see what, you know, Alpine uh, does, you know, of course, uh, uh, a lot of turmoil there between them, uh, McLaren, and um, uh, who else? Where, where's Fernando Alonso going? I forgot already. Aston Martin. Aston Martin. So a lot of a lot of turnover between those three teams. But um, you know, I think uh, we'll see. We'll see how they they perform. Um, they've been kind of one of the, I guess, better teams of the midfield. Uh, and I, you know, I think um, they might have something to show for. I guess being the best of the midfield uh, teams, um, you know, like to see, you know, what uh, uh, AlphaTauri does uh, between Pierre Gasly and Yuki Tsunoda. Um, I think Gasly's been pretty solid so far this year, uh, this season, but, you know, Yuki Tsunoda hasn't really been very much of anything. Uh, so a little bit of divergence between the two teammates, um, but, you know, uh, yeah, I think Gasly has been pretty solid and will continue to be, but, uh, you know, it's been been a while since we've seen Formula One, so you know, I think it's you're. 
outside of her stopping, you know, I think in that stuff, you know, you're kind of going in with the fresh slate. You know, I think everybody is really. So, um, you know, be interested to see, you know, what happens. Of course, they, they have made some changes to the track, uh, the runoffs on Erosion and Radiance. So, um, yeah, I, I, you know, I think um, that might be a little bit of an interesting dynamic. Um, maybe not, but uh, it could be could be something to watch for, I guess. Uh, but you know, overall, um, looking for you know flat out racing with this you know with this new car this year. Um, you know, we've seen we've seen a race here so far, and um, there have been um, a lot of interesting things that have come out of it. But um, you know, Spa is a very very flat out high speed circuit. Uh, you know, especially the you know the, you going through erosion and then going through um, down the the long straight uh, there. So it, it's it's going to be an interesting. Uh, Grand Prix to watch from from that perspective, um, and we'll see. You know, um, can you know Red Bull continue to power through um, on the high speed sections, and then uh, the the more technical parts of Spa can can they master that, or will Ferrari figure out how to uh, fill in the gap uh, and close close the deal um, and you know get a podium or potentially even steal victory? Yeah, you brought up. Oh, Rouge and Ratty on those big uh, changes that they made to the runoff after all the massive accidents and deaths that have happened here recently, unfortunately. Um, they're also preparing for MotoGP to come there. So they had to make those runoffs. Um, they used to run at Spa and they used to run in plenty of places where Formula 1 ran with runoffs uh, the way they were. Um, which tells you how crazy those guys were. They were racing those bikes in the 80s and the early 90s on those 500. But, um, yeah. yeah go and, back to the 60s when the original spa circuit. <laughs> yeah, and Jackie Stewart almost ate it over there um, coming out of Rouge. So, I mean, it, it's it's insane to think what racing was and the fact that we have the likes of Mario Andretti and AJ Floyd here still. Uh, is a kind of a miracle and all that. So, uh, yeah, Max wins, but if Ferrari can get out of their own way, they're better on one lap pace generally than Red Bull. What is Sergio Perez bringing to the table? He had a couple of bad races at the end of the first part of the season. Has he checked out or is he going to come back in? That's a big deal in regards to what it means i mean it doesn't mean anything because they're going to win constructors whatever but does he want to finish second in points and make it look good or does he not care that's something we have to look at uh mercedes is what i'm looking at uh, spa is in between kind of track in terms of roughness you have to have low downforce is that gonna bring up all the porpoising issues again or have they fixed those are they able to have the pace because they have not had top-end pace all year. Uh, Lewis is a four-time winner of this race, should be five-time winner of this race. And frankly, you know, he's just trying to get one pull and one win to continue his streak for his whole entire career. That's essentially what he's running for at this point, and then preparing for next year. Uh, George Russell's building, this is, as Josh mentioned, place where he scored his first front-row start, first podium, um of his career coming off his first pole last race momentum is there he's been posting on instagram he's feeling loose he's feeling great about the world uh so there is that with him vettel starts the last nine races of his uh legendary formula one career finished fifth last year in this race uh it'll be lucky to get anywhere near that uh, this this coming weekend and over the next nine weekends that he's re- running, but uh, he's a great driver. He's a great man. Uh, the mid that midfield battle between Alpine and McLaren is something to look at. What is Ricardo bringing to the table? He doesn't know where he's driving. You know they don't. So both Alpine and McLaren don't have theoretically don't have a second driver at the moment. So there are things in play there. Uh, Aston Martin, of course, has two drivers next year. I mean, one and a half, because for as big of a dick as Alonso is, he's still a driver uh, versus who he's going to be running with. And then um, when it comes to uh, Haas, I picked Mick Schumacher to qualify and finish top six on the grid talk uh, because it's a track that just suits him, I think. 
And it's just the Schumacher thing, the whole aura, like your orange, your aura. I'm going full Charlie Murphy. He, 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 your dad, when your dad is one of the greatest people that's ever done this, and he debuted there in a Jordan, qualified in the top seven. If it won for a year box, he probably would have gotten points. Won, won the next year for his first Formula One Grand Prix win. I remember Michael Schumacher's second Grand Prix win because I watched that on TV and I was celebrating it. I think that might have been the only time I ever celebrated a Michael Schumacher victory in my life. But we'll see what Haas has to show for this weekend. Uh, Alpha Tori has been terrible this year. We'll see what they can bring to the table. Uh, they've been god awful. Uh, I think Gasly a reset would be good for him. So I think he'll come back with a little bit more energy. Uh, Sonoda is typical, you know, like Kamui Kobayashi to Kumasato, you know, the like. And then after that, I mean, Alpha Sauber, they're good on these type of tracks. The Ferrari power unit, it's kind of like Haas. If the Ferrari power unit holds up, it could be good. They have to take engine penalties may affect their strategy a little bit. But maybe it's a time to take those engine penalties so you don't have them at Zanfort next week and then for Monza the following week. Um, then after that, I mean, for Vettel, hopefully he can get something out of it. For Alex Albon, he can get something out of these next few weeks as well. But we will talk about it next week on the Grip Trip Podcast. Uh, I was going through the results. I mean, essentially, Hamilton, Vettel, best drivers there amongst active drivers i mean albon actually has the best average finish but that's going to drop a bunch uh now uh, after this weekend but val valtteri botas um is uh third best average amongst current um active drivers so interesting and gasly is fifth so interesting to see vettel's won there three times hamilton four times ricardo and his first year for Red Bull won there. Um, Verstappen's three-lap victory last year. What a joke. Uh, Leclerc's, I think Leclerc won his first career race there at Spa in uh, 2019. Yeah, 2019. Yeah, that was his first career win uh, there. So it would be uh, a very timely victory if he could go and get one. I mean, he's 80 points behind. He won back-to-back -back races at um, Spa and Monza. If he could go to Max or stop, if he could go and run off three straight victories, that might actually make it a little more interesting, but it really doesn't matter in terms of the driver's championship. That's the way to hold off Mercedes. Go out there, get out of your own way, stop dick-stepping on yourselves, go and win three straight races with a car that can compete. Uh, but I don't think Max is going to let that happen. Uh, okay, so now we get to Cup Xfinity at Daytona. So we'll start with Xfinity. It's more Xfinity. It's more Xfinity. It's more interesting. Uh, 43 cars for 38 spots. Uh, what's it called? Yeah, I'm on the trucks. Why am I on the trucks? Yeah, 43. So yeah, five cars will miss the show. So you have to consider, so I guess, Josh, do we consider everybody in this or are we kind of taking into account people that are likely to go and miss the show here before we consider the algorithm? Well, yeah, that's an interesting question there. And I mean, the way I've got it set up right now, uh, I think I do have it set up for everybody. So oh, that's so you have uh, all 43. All right. Everybody. So now... So, all right, so I have to bring up owner points. That's interesting. Uh, owner points going into this weekend. So following, so you, you the top 30, I think top 34 uh, get in on speed or top, yeah, I think top 34 get in on speed or 32. It's one of those. Um, and uh, usually the battle becomes, it comes after, you know, like, Amongst the teams like the 08 car, uh, I don't know, was the 08 car is run by David Starr this weekend. So that's usually where the interesting stuff happens. The 38 uh, car, which this weekend's being driven by Kyle Sieg, 
that's 25th in points. So essentially, I'm saying the top 24 in owners' points, which 24th is uh, was a Jeb Burton in 27. You have the 31 with Myatt Snyder. Uh, before that's Jeremy Clements, a 36 car. And then the other SS Greenlight car, which has a victory this year. So they'd be locked in anyway, along with um, the 48 car, the big machine car, which has a victory. So they're locked in. So the top 24 essentially are locked into the race. The real battle starts at 25th with the 38, the 91, the 08. So Alpha Prime, both Alpha Prime cars, the have uh, Sage Karam is running and then Caesar Baccarella who is the Alpha is the Alpha Prime and Alpha Prime, uh he's going to run at Daytona, so they need to run good on speed. They're usually good for that. Getting into other points after that, the four car for JD Motorsports um, and the six car for JD Motorsports. So both JD Motorsports cars. But, um, you know, we we just to bring it up, Brian Vargas had a good run in February there in qualifying. Bailey Curry also did all right. And he has Alka Seltzer sponsorship uh, this coming weekend. So hopefully both of those guys can make the show. Um, the six car missed the show last week, unfortunately, with Spencer Pump Alley uh, at Watkins Glen. The 78 for BJ McLeod is in there, and um, I'm trying to see who's the 78 is with Matt Mills. So Matt Mills has to qualify on speed. Jesse Awuji, uh, his car is dead last amongst all the cars. Or no, no. He's next to last amongst all the cars that have tried to make an attempt every race. Um, but they've made shows, so they actually have points. Um, on, out, unlike Mike Harmon's 47. And Jesse Uwuji, of course, is running this week. So there's a good chance that Jesse Uwuji is going to miss the show, which would be fine. Um, and he should not be on a restrictor plate track. He shouldn't be on any track. Well, yeah, but and I mean, neither, especially on a yeah. super speedway. Yeah, and then neither should C.J. McLaughlin in the 28 car. Uh, he's another one. Uh, getting into the field itself, Josh Williams is back with DGM uh, after a failed experiment at B.J. McLeod's team. Matt Mills is in the 78. Timmy Hill is going to be running a Chevy uh, for MBM with Hendrick Engines, so they're going to probably make make the show on speed. Ronnie Bassett has to make it in on time. Mason Massey, the 91, is another one that uh, they don't have the points, or they're, they're 26th in points. They're right in that mix, as I mentioned earlier. And um, J.J. Ailey, the MBM number 66, is there in that mix as well. They're going to also have a Hendrick Chevy uh, package for this weekend. Uh you know, the Alpha Prime team, they're going Chevy this weekend. The rumors were they're going to go and combine. They were going to um, make a deal with Stuart Haas and go to Ford, but it, I guess that didn't happen. Um, Joey Gase will be in the 35 this weekend, and that team is in that mix as well, points-wise. So I think the qualifying, if they run, if they actually run qualifying, if it doesn't get affected by weather, is as intriguing, if not more intriguing, than um, the race itself because there's some interesting players there. Sam Hunt is going to have the Nemechek's running together if they can get them both in the show. John Hunter's guaranteed in with the 26, but his dad... Uh, 1992 Bush Series champion Joe Nemechek, multiple winner at Daytona in the uh, Xfinity Series, will be running a second car for them, and they're going to have Eric Phillips as their crew chief. So it'd be a shame if they miss the show. Uh, multiple winner in um, Xfinity Series at Daytona and Talladega, Justin Haley. He needs qualifying to happen, or else he's not going to make the show. Call against four cars. Uh, he's the fourth car there. And then, uh, yeah, Sammy Smith's going to run the 18 car this coming weekend. Uh, Joe Graff is back for whatever reason. Natalie Decker is in the five car. So she will, um, she's in that mix as well. 
uh, for for making the race on speed. Uh, so I don't know where the end where the owners' points work. So after all of that. What are you looking at in regards to your picks? Who do you look as your winner, your wild card, and what does the algorithm spit out? The uh, Tate Fogelman <laughs> algorithm spit out for the Xfinity series. What the hell is this race being called? It's the uh, the Wawa 250. Yeah, good sponsor. The Wawa I, 250. I like Wawa. I yeah I I live at Wawa. I I told the guy at the Wawa in Peaberg that if they had if I had my uniform it would be like Wawa, Coles, Miller Lite. Well, now it's like seltzer, so I have to figure out what hard seltzer sponsor I want. Um but yeah, Miller Lite, Wawa and like Coles. That would be my sponsorship package for my um situation based on and probably like columbia 300 and uh 900 global for bowling uh that that would be my um sponsorship package if i was racing i wish i would have pba tour sponsorship back in the day like terry cook did in the truck series so let us know what you're thinking in regards to the wawa 250 get a sizzly on saturday if there was a Wawa up by you, go and get a sizzle and get a coffee. You oh, yeah. I mean, there's, yeah, I mean, side note on the Wawa. I mean, yeah, they, Wawa didn't start showing up in Florida until like 2012, 2013. So uh, once they started showing up, like, you know, it's, it's game over. Um, yeah, they're pretty good. But I mean, try to get a, a hoagie or something like that maybe this week. But, you know, as far as this race goes, um, I mean, this, this is, um, there's a lot of players in this field. Because um, when you exclude who's likely not to make it in, but um, I mean, I th- look at the uh, top half of the field, and you know, Junior Motorsports, Colleg Racing, Colleg's got four cars uh, this week, which is going to you know have a little bit of extra wrinkle. We know how they like to work the draft and uh, how they race when it comes down to the final laps, and then you got Junior Motorsports, who's kind of starting to figure it out, but you know, they still got that kind of that old school plate racing mentality of um you know trying to race for themselves uh you know like what junior kind of did back in the day um this is going to be really interesting and uh the dynamic between these two teams how they're going to work together with each other um and then you know you've got uh the gibbs team uh you know ty gibbs and brandon jones um and sammy smith also racing again this week so that might be interesting from the uh toyota aspect of it um, but yeah, the Xfinity racing, um, there's going to be, going to be a lot of, um, you know, push drafting on the straights and, you know, they can have to back off in the corners. Um, but it, yeah, I'm very curious to see how it plays out because it, it does play out a lot differently than, uh, the racing in the cup series does. But, uh, as for me, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to go with, uh, I'm going to go with AJ Allmendinger winning, uh, this weekend in, in uh, Daytona for Xfinity. Like I said, I think colleague, you know, they figured it out. They have the past couple of years. Um, you know, last year the finish didn't go the way that they wanted it to. Uh, but you know, they, or maybe a couple of years ago, I might be misremembering this, but, uh, but you know, they, they always work together pretty well. So yeah, I'll go with AJ Almendinger, uh, winning the race. And then, you know, as a, as a wild card, uh, it's tough, but, uh, and can't can't count out uh Richard Childress racing. By the way, uh, they they run pretty well at Daytona as well. Uh, you know, as a as a wild card, we'll go with uh, you know, I'm I'm gonna go with uh John Hunter Nemechek as a wild card. Uh, it's a little bit out there, but you know, I think I think you know with with uh Toyota Alliance, as long as they make it into the field, you know, they they might be up there uh towards the end. Um. And, um, you know, he's, I don't know how well, of a super, he's not as well as a super speedway racer as, as he is maybe in the truck series, but, you know, he might, he might be able to figure out a way to be up there in the top 10 by the end of the day. And, uh, you know, that brings us to the algorithm pick, the world famous Tay Fogelman algorithm pick, uh, picker, as you called it. Uh, and I went and ran this while you were doing the uh, roundup and everything for both Xfinity and Cup, and it picks number 48. Ricky Stenhouse Jr. racing this weekend here for Big Machine Racing. So good old O. Richard uh, going out and uh, winning the race. That's what the algorithm says. 
posted it in our page. Oh, Richard in the 48. Um, <laughs> that's how I posted it. And the Tate Fogelman algorithm equals Oh, Richard in the 48. He is a super speedway specialist. It all started in the first gen, I guess, gen five Xfinity race when they went to these cars, uh, when they changed to this body style. Uh, after he almost got fired in 2008, that's when his career changed and he had a big weekend, um, at Daytona. And, um, that's why he still has a job now in, in the cup series. So, uh, AJ Allmendinger as a winner, he's never won a super speedway race in the Xfinity series. Somehow, uh, John Hunter Nemechek as his wild as Josh's wild card. And, um, uh, the, uh, algorithm for yes for josh put that as a star and uh oh richard richard is the algorithm i was going through the results from earlier this year there were uh two junior motorsports cars aj almanier finished second and austin hill won sheldon creed finished uh six so two rcr cars two junior motorsports cars and one um college racing car in the top 10 and then uh Keebler finished 11th uh the 26 car was in the race with Truex Ryan Truex starting tailback and he finished 12th so that car has speed so they they're a Gibbs supported car uh for me it I guess it could work out as a as a wild card too I'm going to go and pick um I'm going to pick Daniel Hemrick. It has nothing to do with uh, his performance so far this year because there hasn't been a whole hell of a lot to show for it. He's going to have extra time in uh, the cup car. One of his last two races he's going to get to run this year in the cup series is uh, this weekend, uh, as long as they have practice. So Daniel Hemrick won the pole, won both stages in February. And uh, as to start his defense of the Xfinity Series Championship, and as this season has gone on, um, his opportunities have probably dwindled. Uh, I think he'll probably have a job next year at Colleg anyway, but it has not gone well for him and for um, for um, his uh, his wife Ken, for Kenzie, and for Ren and all of them and for their new baby that's coming along. But I'm saying the pain finally ends. Hamrick gets a victory, locks himself into the playoffs here. Uh, Colleg gets the job done. The wild card for me, I'm going to pick somebody that I figure can make the show. Uh, somebody that's going to make the show. And uh, yeah, I'm going to pick Jeb Burton. Yeah, I'm just picking guys that have done nothing. Uh, Jeb has won a super speedway race before in his career. And uh, I remember it was about eight years ago when he was a, a truck series regular for Turner Motorsports. And I think he finished third in points that year, thereabouts, one of those years. Um, I think he won a super speedway race in that. Uh, I think he won Daytona, but I might be wrong. I th but his daddy has won the Daytona 500 somehow. Uh, he's run well at super speedways in his career. That team, our motorsports, is basically built to run good at super speedways. Him and uh, I could have picked. Uh, I could have picked Anthony Alfredo, who's one of the only people that has a chance to possibly back into the playoffs. I don't have an algorithm. So I'm just making this pick and I'm just pulling it out of my ass. <laughs> um, my, my Philip Matthew pull it out of my ass pick is Ryan Vargas, uh, just because I like him and he likes chicken nuggets, but they're not going to do anything. But a super wild card pick there. I'll tell you what, if the pull it out of my ass pick wins, if, if Ryan Vargas wins, I'm, I'm probably going to have a stroke. So there won't be an encrypted podcast <laughs> uh, uh, next week. Um, God bless them and God bless Johnny Davis Motorsports. But if they win, I'll tell you, that would be something. Um, his odds have to be like a thousand. Yeah, pulling it out of his ass. Exactly. That is exactly right. Um, the 
cup race at Daytona. I'll start so we can build up the suspense for um, the algorithm and everything. So the smallest field at uh, in a race at Daytona in I don't know how many years. They they I read that earlier. It's a 37 car field at Daytona. Um, the changes this week. We'll see Reagan in the 15. Hemrick will be in the 16, as I mentioned. Um, going scrolling through. Uh, Gibbs, of course, will be in the 45. Uh, Gagson will be running the Beard Motorsports uh, uh, 62 with help from uh, the Gone family in South Point Casino. Landing Castle will be running double duty, uh, running the 77. So the same sponsorship that are running on the 16 and 77 will run on the 10 and 11 in the Xfinity Series. Blowjob McLeod uh, looking at losing his charter. If somebody bids enough money for it, uh, probably needs a big run in this spot. It probably won't matter. Uh, He's back in the 78. So who am I picking? Am I going to go and pick somebody that's already won a race? Am I going to pick somebody who hasn't won a race? It would be more interesting to pick somebody. It's like it would be a, it would be on brand if I go and just pick Christopher Busher or I pick Bradley Keselowski because Bradley Keselowski has won this race before. Um, and as Josh mentioned earlier at Daytona this past February, they won. Both of them won the uh, duels. The Roush cars won the duels at Daytona. In February, Brad uh, wasn't uh, all that great in a race. Uh, Busher, I don't really remember what he did, but I'll just go and pick YRB. He'll close it out. He'll win two races in a row at Daytona, and he'll lock himself in, and it won't be a question of points. He'll just win, and um, he'll get the relief that he actually makes the playoffs. Uh, when he's third in points and a Martin Truex gets relegated, he, he's essentially getting relegated. It's like being in European football or, you know, outside of this country when like, that's what has to happen to like the jets or certain teams that exist in, in our, in our realm, in our major sports, like the Knicks have to be relegated. The jets have to be relegated. There's that's what has to, that's what's going to end up happening to Martin Truex here on Saturday night. He's going to finish 17th in points and he's going to wonder, like he's going to think he's back at furniture row in 2014 when he thought his life, his career and life were over. But my wild card for Saturday night is Bubba. It's not a wild card, but it is because he's right on the cusp. I mean, it's the best wild card that you could come up with. Yeah, and it's and if he wins, the amount of people that are going to kill themselves or die probably is selective enforcement is probably natural selection. Uh, If if Bubba Wallace wins on Saturday night, oh man, I'm here for it. I I tell you, Um, not just because. (laughs) It would cause conniptions and and lots of people to have to go to the hospital. But because for Toyota and for their brand, they'd get five out of six, 83% of their cars into the playoff. Uh, Who X would be the guy that falls out anyway. And Blaney. So Bubba would knock out his BFF. And a corporate teammate. Yeah, and a corporate teammate. And Bubba would probably, that's, likely to be his best man too that that's a whole other thing since he's getting married at the end of the year uh him and amanda are getting married at the end of this year um so he's gonna knock out his possible best man out of in his wedding and one of his groomsmen too so that there's there's a whole lot uh just just for that alone it'd be great um so yeah I'll I'll go YRB Blaine uh, and Bubba, so kind of favoritism going there, and then the pull it out of your ass pick. I can't pull Corey because he has no chance. Um, the pull it out of your ass pick that actually has a chance to make the playoff because they're inside of the top thirty is just Haley. The dude's done it before. He did it in a Spire car, and you know he's in a better car now. So why not? I mean, Colleague has been on the cusp all year. They with AJ. The irony is if AJ was running for cup points this whole year, he'd be in the top 20 in points. He's been that good. 
Hemrick, more or less for the races he ran, was pretty good too. But definitely AJ, if he was running for points this year, would be in a position he would have probably won a race, in my opinion. So Justin Haley was a super speedway specialist going and winning a race. So for Phil, it... um, Yeah, he said, I was about to type it out. Yeah, yeah, all right, go ahead. Blaney Blaney to win. Blaney to win. My wild card is uh, Daryl uh, Wallace. No, hold Jr. on, hold on. It's William Daryl Wallace. William Daryl Wallace Jr. Um, Ryan, young Ryan Blaney. Um, and then um, Justin, JJ. You should just put it in for our sake. He should be JJ Haley because that's where he came into this sport. He was JJ Haley um, before he became Justin Haley. Oh. Um, but then they figured out he'd be like, oh, you they, they think you were J.J. Yaley, and he's not that good of a stock car driver. But, yeah, those are my picks. Um, how about you, Josh? Yeah, I mean, for me, uh, well, I mean, you picked it. I was going to pick Blaney there, to be honest, because uh, you had it. Or I, I've got the Team Penske shirt on, and I was going to pick Blaney to go and take the last spot, but you already did that. So we'll go a different direction there. Uh uh, yeah, you know, I'm. It's it's a really interesting uh, deal here, but you know, uh, I'm gonna go with uh, you know, I'll, I'll this is a pull it out of your ass, but it makes sense. I'll go with Brad Keselowski here, uh, because you know he had a good car in February. He had the probably the the best car uh on on speed uh here at, at Daytona. So you know, I think um, it's uh you know a good chance he could get in. And cause a little bit of controversy, knock out his former teammate in in uh, Ryan Blaney, uh, knock out a former junior, another junior protege, and uh, Martin Truex Jr. out of the playoffs. So it's all it's all right there um, for me. A uh, wild card in this event, uh, Coke Zero Four Hundred entry list. Uh, wild card, I'll go with uh, Michael McDowell. Because uh, he won the Daytona 500 already in 2021, and he's uh, a really good restrictor plate super speedway racer. So, you know, why not? Let's go with let's go with that. So, two drivers out of the out of the realm here, but at least one of them makes uh, a lot of sense because he's got credibility, and um, you know, he's been a Daytona winner before, and uh, well, both of them are, but one did it legitimately, and. Um, you know, Brad. Brad had a good car back in Daytona 500 back in the in February, uh, and now for the long-awaited, long-awaited uh, grip strip podcast, Tate Fogelman algorithm machine pick, and it says Noah Gregson in the 62 wins the race. <laughs> I see your face right there. You can't believe it. You can't believe it. <laughs> I'm dead right now. <laughs> wow, you you made me dry heave and make faces, and you can just make a bunch of memes now. So now here's the th- so here's the thing. I'm doing a, a I'm doing a a, a Pablo Tori thing because you're you you and Pablo Tori are kind of like in the same realm, Asian, half Asian, whatever. So <laughs> here's the thing with all the memes that you can make with this. You're going to have to run them through me because I almost threw up on my new microphone and I was going through all the fields like, oh, God, he picked Gagson. And then I'm like, well, it's Wendy's. So I'm like, eh, it's not so bad, but they're not Wendy's this week. It's freaking South Point. Fuck South Point. But I'm like, I want to go there because I mean, I'm a Brendan Gaughan it's, fan. It fits. it fits. It's a lottery pick. <laughs> Yeah, but you're expecting Noah Gagson to actually make it to the end, which, I mean, he won't do drugs when he's driving in a cup car. He probably would when he's in his regular car, but holy mother of God. That, you need to post this, since you're the video guy, you're going to have to post this whole entire reaction and whatever. Yeah, I, I'm going to have to clip this, yeah. We're going to have to clip this. We're going to have to clip, we're going to have to clip a thing for... NBC Sports and Map 360, but we're gonna have to clip the reaction to the the guy that's gonna resurrect Richard Petty Motorsports GMS 
in the realm of inbred LCD dipshits and people who drink uh, whatever the hell. Oh, White Claws? Yeah, that's hogwash. That's your, that's your that's your sponsor right there, White Claw. You were just talking about it. You need a hard seltzer. Yeah, go with uh, you got your boy Noah Gregson drinking White Claws. You can get sponsored by them. No, I'll 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 do the Dos Equis Ranch Water instead, or Trulies, uh, just so I don't have to ever have anything to do with that fucking tool. Oh uh, my god, god damn. Oh man. All right, you can keep going. That was yeah, that was that was pretty good. I got I got you there. Thank you. Uh, well. I had to say thank you to uh, Google Docs this week. Thank for that you, one. thank you, Tate Fogelman. Yeah, because <laughs> um, my my Microsoft Excel account was through my school, and my school account has expired, and I had to do this through Google Docs through Google Sheets. So I hope that didn't change anything. But hey, that's how it works. It get, you that's can what afford it. Gives it. Us. You're high society. You can afford a Microsoft. <laughs> to freeload it on. Yeah, I I admit that. Yeah, but I just I haven't used it at home. I don't really. Well, use so Microsoft now you're admitting you're you're Asian because you're a freeloader. So it's going to the whole <laughs> Russell Peters thing. We're going we're going into our Asian roots now because it's the same jokes that I was making with Wilson, and we're we're about to transition yeah, to, to fantasy handle. football. So we're so I was making the jokes about how Wilson and Vic have all their their forms and sheets and all that, and Wilson had to go and specify the fact that he was at his kids the kids not his kids but like a kid's birthday party and he was using Yahoo ADP. He wanted to say that he wasn't using his usual setup uh, to draft. But yes, this is a very so if people didn't understand that the GSP has an Asian flair, let's tell you this. It's right in I'm, front of you. <laughs> yeah, I'm Asian too, South. And so is Josh. He's North, but is part Asian. But then we also can enunciate. So that's where the Jeff Gordon thing comes in. And we're NASCAR fans, we're motorsports fans, we're we're very educated. Um, Josh is better educated than I am, um, and that's what it is. I really don't know how I'm supposed to keep on going with this, with that fucking algorithm picking Noah Gregson. It's a, at least pick Cody Ware. Like, I, I could deal with Cody Ware. Like, Cody Ware deals, like, I have similar shit with Cody Ware, but his dad's rich. I, I mean, I don't have money, but it's like, oh, fucking Gagson, of all people. Oh man, why couldn't Brendan Gone drive that car? I wish it would have been Brendan yeah. Gone. I love Brendan Gone, but no, it has to be this fucking drug yeah, out. I should, we should just change the name of it to just pick drivers that Phil hates. <laughs> no, because the fact is the algorithm usually is good. But if you, if if but the because it's usually interesting. This time is fucking oh. Oh, we picked Caesar Baccarella in February. Oh yeah, that's, I forgot. Yeah, that's yeah. true. You picked Caesar Baccarella. I'm like, all right, good, whatever. Who cares? He's gonna wreck anyway. It's fine. <laughs> um, but but he owns a team, so it's like ah, fuck it. But oh god, this asshole's gonna put it in the fence like 30 laps in. He's gonna be in the infield doing lines and and drinking drinking whatever the hell, the hogwash moonshine and probably getting fucked in the ass. And that's the algorithm. We've, we've made a pick. There is, this is a supposed to be a serious thing. The Tate Fogelman algorithm. And now it's connected to Noah Gagson. Oh God. Okay. All right. Yeah. Um, we're going to the fantasy football, um, fall brawl, uh, situation here. And, um, you know that we Yankees won, yes, because Aaron Judge got a two run shot, so that's part of it. Um, my team is renamed to Freelands Analytics, which is a double entendre. Um, for you educated people, I think you can figure it out. Um, and the I mean, she has a huge schnozzle, so there's like a triple entendre there. Uh, but you know. Uh, because K Adams has disappeared, that's why. That I or else I would have left my team name for K Adams Froyo. Uh, I was able to draft Austin Eckler at the number four pick. I might have been able to go with a wide receiver there. I decided to go with my usual 
with my feel and my uh, setup. I got Austin Eckler. I was able to get Stefan Diggs, who's with Buffalo. And uh, I've also got Michael Pittman. My running backs after Eckler are are Javante Williams. Antonio Gibson, which is kind of iffy. I got Michael Thomas, but he just hurt his hamstring, so I'm starting to be worried about it. My quarterbacks are Joey Burrow, who's who isn't playing yet and who knows, but I think he'll play when it matters and Trevor Lawrence. So that made Josh mad. Um, I picked Cole commit, which was a joke I had between my friends, uh, my BFFs, Vic and uh, Wilson that, uh, I put it up the tight end position because those assholes wanted the tight end back and I'm like, Oh yeah, I'm going to freaking fanboy out for Cole commit. So I did it exactly for that reason. So I'm hoping Cole commits the reason I get the belt back. Um, I say get the belt back, even though the belt is still in my possession along with the ring. Um, that's essentially my starters right now, at least for this for week one. As of now, uh, I have some other people that are not exactly the most stable. Um, Davis Mills is my third quarterback. We have a two quarterback league with a super flex, so. Uh, that's what I have. My IDPs, Fred Warner, who is just part of the, uh, top, uh, he's part of 20 to hundred in the top 100. I have Daniil Hunter and Antoine Winfield for our, my IDPs. So we will see what happens. I had a little buyers or more. So some of my picks later in the draft, my draft grade was B minus. So whatever the hell that's worth. Um, but Josh, you, had uh you did pretty good you got a b and uh you're going against vic for week one and uh you did you did pretty solid man you're you're you did your thing you got you went solid you went strong you have you have derrick henry Najee harris and debo samuels so that or or if you ask certain people on nfl network debo samuels debo samuel is his government uh, and Debo Samuels is what some of the people call him in the media, which tells you that they need to go to school or they failed out of school. Uh, but you have a solid team as you always do. Uh, let us know what you're thinking about your team and um, lead into the um, your segment as well, your sim segment. Yeah, of course. Um, you know, with, this team, um, you know, I think for me, um, yeah, it's pretty solid overall. Debo Samuel, Derrick Henry, Najee Harris, um, Darren Waller, I think is also a good solid tight end. Seems to produce well um, when when he's needed. Um, Tyreek Hill is a little iffy because uh, you know uh, Tua non, you know Tua, Tua uh, is not really that great of a quarterback, and I don't think you know trading for a star wide receiver like Tyreek Hill is really going to change that. Um, despite all the offseason hype from from that team and everything, and, and their new head coach, Man, which yeah, is Mike 49ers. McDaniel is a good guy. Yeah. yeah, he's a good guy, but I don't know if it's enough to uh, overcome deficiencies of uh, two tag Viola in the NFL. Uh, but I do have a little bit of. I mean, for me, I got a little bit of buyer's remorse because um, Derek Carr, Mac Jones, not really the best QB setup, considering other people um, have uh, mobile QBs as their. Uh, uh, you know, starters, you know, people with um, Vic got a uh, Dak Prescott and Tom Brady. That's a lethal combination right there because. Well, yeah, um, that was that yeah. was something I was going to say about how the quarterback run started. That was kind of stupid compared to what other drafts would be. But I think it's mainly based on how we my scoring is with six for quarterback touchdowns instead yeah. of four. Uh, the points, like we have special point settings for quarterbacks as well with bonuses that kind of drove that, but I wasn't really happy about that. The tight ends also went in a weird way as well, but yeah, definitely the quarterbacks went way too quick. And then Vic, he, he went Dak Prescott and whatever, and then he picked Trey, which, uh, fucked me and Wilson up. And I think it fucked everybody up because I think everybody in the league that was focused was trying to get Trey Lance. Um, let's, let's get any, the, if people want to, I know people don't listen to this show yet for fantasy content. It's not my personal fandom. The fact of the matter is if you want two quarterbacks that are not in the first tier, your 12 team or 10 team league tier, 
that are going to come through. You're looking at the fans right here. I got it right here. I'm pointing at Josh, pointing at myself. Pick Trevor Lawrence, pick Trey Lance. If you want to win your fantasy leagues in a one-quarterback league and you want to get crazy, if you want to be in a two-quarterback league, that's how you win. You pick the guy that's done work, should have won a Heisman Trophy, just like Peyton Manning. So he's going to have that Peyton Manning ego thing. And now he has a coach. And they have an offense and they have a running game and all that. They have a good offensive line. Uh, Not as good as they need to, but they're getting there. You need that. And the guy's elite, elite, elite. And you need a guy that might that is an athlete, that is a freak of nature, that's really smart. There you go. Yeah. You're welcome. A, You're welcome. It's a solid pick there. But yeah, I had Trey Lance on my draft board actually. I I had him there and I was I was considering it for a couple of rounds before he went. And I was like, I don't know, because like, you know, one hand he's, you know, got a lot of potential, but then on the other hand, um, it's a rookie quarterback. I know rookies uh tend to struggle in the NFL the first year and um um, you know, there's going to be a lot of potential for turnovers and, uh, things like that. You know, even, you know, it's all preseason, but you know, that things happen like that in the regular season, but you know, we'll see what happens, um, there. Uh, so ended up, I actually was the last team to pick a quarterback and that's when I went and got, uh, Derek Carr and then last round I got Mac Jones. So, um, we'll see what happens there. I mean, my strategy was going two RB, two running backs, um, because I felt like I felt like that's what you needed, uh, but I guess I forgot to consider the scoring system, and I probably should have just gone quarterback the second round instead no, of double. I th- I think the end of the day, your strategy is better because you got two beasts and you have both forty nine er wide receivers. So the fact is, you have leverage amongst myself and Luke because we're both forty nine er fans. So in essentially, you could offer later in the year. Uh, Ayuk or Samuel, depending on what it is, you're probably not going to move Samuel uh, because he's going to do the jet sweeps and all that. But Ayuk, like I like your team, I'm looking at your team right now, and I'm like, fuck. If your quarterbacks, if Derek Carr shows out for Josh McDaniels, you only have two quarterbacks. So that's kind of an issue, but um, but you yeah, have, we'll deal with it later in the year. Yeah, you can deal with it on the buys and all that, but. You have Buddha and Miles Garrett, who are beasts, both of them. And you know your boy, Foyer, so you know he's going to be able to produce. So your team is set. Like, your grade was just below, uh, what's his name? I'm trying to remember, uh, bring it up, bringing up the thing. But, yeah, Steve, who's uh, Vic's buddy who just joined the league. But, honestly, the quarterbacks... I think the quarterback look is kind of the deviation. It looks weird because of how the flow went in the draft. Uh, but if Derek Carr does what he wants to do with his boy, since he got Devontae Adams there, and he still has, uh, what the hell's his name? What's the, the other guy? Uh, the the guy from Clemson, um, Hunter Renfro. I, I, was looking at vi- I was looking at video of a certain guy. Name is Hunter Renfro. Pretty good looking guy, man. I, I can't do John Gruden. I need to be able to do a John Gruden. I wish I could. Um, I'm doing, and that's based on the uh, Frank Caliendo. But you, they have those two guys. You have Darren Waller. So you did the you did the combination. Your team's looking good, man. Uh, you have a good shot. Uh, I was I was having buyers or more with my team, but. As the uh, alcohol sinks in and I think about it, it is what it is. We'll see what happens. We have time. And this league is competitive enough. I think there's going to be a lot of swinging and trading going on. So might be able to go and get some people that I kind of wanted or thought I could get in the draft. And same for you. And who knows? Making the playoffs in this league is going to be tough. And I know you're in other leagues and I don't know when you're drafting uh, I don't know when I'm drafting for my other league. I know my keeper league is only drafting in like the end of this month. So uh, a lot of time to go between now and then. Uh, still time for injuries and all that to play a role. Yeah, so yeah, we'll see how it plays out. Um, I mean, yeah, I think you're right about the QB thing. On a, you know, I mean, it's nice to have all the flashy QBs and everything, but then at the same time, um, um, yeah, I got leverage because I have solid players all around. Um, so... And plus, you know, QBs always get production. You know, you can pop, swap them in and out as needed. So um, you can get away with that. You know, of course, there's always going to be those crazy games. But, um, you know, 
you know, I'll be able to work with it. So I'm not too concerned. You know, we'll just have to be uh, very uh, in tune with uh, the the rest of the league uh, in our league as well. So yeah, we'll see how it goes and everything. So yeah, we'll move on to the uh, sim segment here and just you know talk about what I did in iRacing last week. Um, yeah, mostly um for me it was uh, Watkins Glen uh, at iRacing uh, last week. Uh, Mostly, you know, just did the cup car at Watkins Glen. Um, you know, it was really interesting. Uh, the uh, cup car, you know, driving driving the cup car at Watkins Glen with this new next gen car. Um, really have to make sure you hit your braking points uh, at the time, at the right time, because there's a lot of times where I um, locked it up and overran the corner going to turn one and went off track. Uh, you know, pat, way past the uh, the curbs. Uh, off corner exit in turn one, you know, um, off into, you know, all, all into the runoff there. Uh, that was an issue. Um, the, uh, yeah, the last, the last turn before, uh, the, you know, turn, turn seven, uh, coming or turn six coming to that left hander, um, can be a bit of a trouble spot as well. Uh, the bus stop, the bus stop wasn't really as bad, but, uh, you know, it was all about maximizing your speed as that's the fastest part of the racetrack there. Um, so it was really just about, you know, mastering the braking points and, and finding, um, the places where, where to shift and, uh, you know, downshift and upshift, uh, through, you know, throughout the track, um, there. So, uh, yeah, it was, uh, there was some struggles there, but, you know, was able to go through it and, uh, have, have a bit of fun racing on that. Um, yeah, I, I did stream, couple of the races I did, uh, mostly as kind of a, I guess, a test, trying to test the audio and, uh, you know, try to, uh, improve the sound so you can hear the game on top of my voice or alongside. So it doesn't sound so muted, I guess. So, uh, yeah, that's, uh, what I was trying to do on there. I think I also did some Miatas as well, uh, at Summit Point Raceway and then at Olton Park Raceway. So, did a little bit of that. Uh, that was that was pretty fun. Um, I always like racing the Miatas. Um, uh, yeah, I I think uh, you know that's always a fun fun series to race in. It's a um, very forgiving car, and um, you can really put it to the limit and uh, get away with a lot of stuff that maybe you wouldn't be able to get away with in a, a you know upper level classes or whatever. But you know, it's all about having fun in that series. Uh, so yeah, that's uh, pretty much what I did in iRacing this week. Um, uh, gaming, the other games, um, did download the new Madden. So, you know, it's all about, you know, it's all about football right now with, uh, fantasy, real life football, you know, getting, getting new gear from the Jags or, well, Jags fans that create good, good gear. And of course, uh, went and downloaded the new Madden, uh, which, uh, they changed up the mechanics of the passing, uh, part of the game for the quarterback. You know, you have choices between, uh, you know, the classic style where you just, you know, press the buttons to pass or now they have um a bit more of a timing and precision and power element to the passing so you can um try to make it a little bit more realistic uh so that's a little bit interesting i i um trying to um master that right now but i have a little bit of trouble um because it's not something i'm used to and it seems like you're kind of working way too hard uh to throw the ball but you know uh try to figure it out see if I can play it that way, if not, go back to the old way, uh, which um, I feel like is a little bit more uh, intuitive, but, you know, we'll figure it out and everything uh, there. So, yeah, uh, probably be doing, you know, outside of the actual race this weekend, which, you know, hopefully, you know, we'll go to and everything, uh, you know, try to get on iRacing later this week and Madden, and maybe I'll stream a little bit Madden if I feel good enough about it. So we'll see. We'll see what happens there. Um yeah, so yeah, that that closes the sim segment, the gaming segment of this podcast, and yeah, we'll move on to the close. And yeah, of course, you can follow me on Twitch uh, for my streams, uh, Twitch TV slash two, and you can go on there, follow me, and see all my stuff, see the latest streams, see the, any clips that I've got. Go on there and uh, follow my videos. Um, and then, of course, myself follow me at JB Huffline on Twitter. See you know what I'm interested in. You know all my Jags takes all my racing takes and any other things i'm interested in you can look at that on there and engage in my content and see if you have anything that you learn from from me or uh from my opinions um or anything i share you can go on there and look at that and then you know of course 
the uh, YouTube page, Grip Cheer Podcast. Uh, go in there, follow our YouTube channel, subscribe, like our videos. Uh, if you watch them, comment in on them, of course. This uh, watch our reactions to you know picking Noah Gregson with the algorithm. You know, obviously, very very good content there. So um, that was a you know you can go on there once we upload that to YouTube and watch that. Uh, so yeah, of course, um, you know, as always, uh, Phil, it's always great to have the show with you and, um, you know, be, uh, you know, glad for the opportunity to do it. So, um, yeah, I'll turn it over to you to finish out the rest of this. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's always great to go and do the show and it's a passion project that we've been able to have, uh, as friends and, uh, something that came up just as, talking on a Facebook page and now we've been able to go and do this and talk about all different types of motorsports. So it's fun here on the Gripster podcast at Gripster pod on Twitter um, at JPL fine for Josh and myself. I'm at Philip G Matthew on Twitter. Uh, we are essentially anywhere you can find podcasts. Uh, we have the Gripster podcast YouTube page as Josh mentioned earlier and um yeah we also are at philipgmatthew.com my blog page uh the show posts there um we will be back for episode 131 next week going over everything that happened this week in motorsports uh we have nascar cup ends their regular season at daytona xfinity the belgian grand prix Rain issues are going on for both NASCAR and F1. You'll have IMSA at VIR, Formula 2 and 43 at, at Spa. We'll also be able to preview IndyCar at Portland and then the Bristol uh, night race weekend triple header for all three NASCAR, major NASCAR series. And then ARCA is also our, will be running there. And um, we'll also go over anything else that's going on next week on the Gripshire podcast, episode 131. We'll have Joe Passero on. Uh, we thank you for listening to Gripshire podcast. Go and like, subscribe. Uh, there will also be a sub episode coming out through the Gripshire podcast realm with myself and Tom Downey from Everything F1 going and doing an uncensored review of essentially teams four through 10 in the uh, constructors championship so far in 2022 and getting into Ferrari a little bit. And that will also lead into another episode after the European triple that we have here over the next three weeks. We have at least another person that wants to go and do it um, during the day since um, they're available since it's a little later in their time and I have time off since I'm on Mondays and um, I just decide I want to go and do two podcasts in a day um, because I'm off. So we will uh, stay tuned for that. Stay tuned for the other one. Thanks for listening to Gripster podcast. Take care and uh, we'll see you next week. Goodbye.